Hello, 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 my friends. All right, we are live on Facebook, on YouTube. Let's see if we can get Facebook started. Shoot, 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 shoot. Hi, YouTube. You guys got started first. Facebook is being annoying as usual. Well, oh, I don't know if that worked. I do not know if that worked. All righty. Let's see here. So hello, my name is Jill Osborne. I'm the president and founder of the Interstitial Cystitis Network. Bear with me while I'm looking at this screen real quick. Good night. You know, we got a big storm and life is crazy. Hi, Facebook. All righty. Facebook, could you guys, hey, for you guys on Facebook, could you do me a quick favor and put something in your in your chat? And I'll be right back. All righty then. Alrighty then, alrighty, alrighty, alrighty. All right, yes, I can see Facebook. Woohoo! <laughs> it's a miracle. All right, so I'm just gonna, I gotta move that there. Hello, Pam. Hi, Cindy. Hi, Susan. Hi, Ann. Hi, Rachel. Alrighty, and now, hello, you guys on YouTube. It's nice to see you. Now, I gotta see you. For you guys on YouTube, could you guys please write something in chat so I can make sure I'm seeing what you're putting in there too? Because I wanna try to get all of your questions. All righty then. Okay, so we are simulcasting live on Facebook and YouTube. It is time for our national IC support group meeting. It is Sunday, April 25th. I hope that you're all having a wonderful day. I really, really do. If you see me looking around, if I'm looking straight, I'm looking at YouTube. If I'm looking over there, I'm looking at Facebook. And I apologize. We're still just trying you know, when you're when you're live streaming to two separate platforms, it's very difficult. It takes a lot of bandwidth right now. And supposedly I'm supposed to have the bandwidth with Comcast. I do not. And so I'm still broadcasting on Comcast on AT&T. And that does require multiple settings. All right. So let me pop out this chat here. There we go. All right. I can see YouTube. I can see Facebook. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Oh. <sighs> All righty then. And I guess the other thing that I could do, let me just try one other thing here real quick. Mm, that would defeat the purpose if I did that. All right. All right. Hello, Pam. Hi, Cindy. Hello, Susan. Hello, Ann. Hi, Rachel. Hi, Leslie. Hi, Ruth. Hello, Cindy. Hi, Judalyn. Hi, Carolyn. Ann says, how do you how do you know if it's IC or overactive bladder? So this is a really interesting situation because back when I was diagnosed, there was no such thing as overactive bladder. Um, it, it was always interstitial cystitis or urethral syndrome or honeymoon cystitis or frequency ur uh, urgency syndrome. And I don't know, for those of you who are a little bit older, do you remember the gotta go, gotta go, gotta go right now commercials, you know, that were on TV? Well, those, they were hired by companies that were marketing new medications for frequency urgency, also known as Ditropan and Deprol. And they were looking for a market savvy way of describing bladder symptoms without, or an incontinence without actually saying incontinence. So they're the ones who came up with this term called overactive bladder. And I remember when it first came out, I emailed one of the top IC doctors and I said, 
I don't get it. I mean, this is still icy, right? And he goes, yeah, this is still icy. Now, of course, we a lot of that has changed now. Um, but basically, the term overactive bladder was originally a marketing term. Now, those companies were smart. What they did is they hired a very famous urologist to start doing research studies on, quote unquote, overactive bladder to get the name into the nomenclature. And now it is accepted. The difference between IC and overactive bladder is basically about the, con the sensation of urgency. If you are running to the bathroom because you, you're in pain and you need to relieve pain, that is going to be interstitial cystitis or, or bladder pain syndrome. If you're running to the bathroom because you're going to leak, you think you're going to be incontinent, that is considered uh, overactive bladder. So overactive bladder patients generally don't have pain. They usually just have frequency urgency with an inkling of incontinence. Interstitial cystitis patients do have usually pain as part of the protocol. Um, I will say that the research, uh, there have been a number of research studies over the years connecting the two that, that many believe that quote unquote overactive bladder is a mild presentation of IC et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then there are some diehards who's, who say, no, they're completely separate. But ultimately, it's that sensation of urgency. If you're running to the restroom because you think you're going to leak, that is defined as overactive bladder. If you're running to the restroom to reduce pain, that is defined as interstitial cystitis. Hello, Emma from the United Kingdom. Jeannie says, thoughts on the COVID shot? How long do flare last from flares on the shot last. Well, hon, I had my, I'm getting my second shot on Thursday. I didn't have a flare at all from, I had the Pfizer shot. Um, uh, you know, and, and this is always getting to kind of this tricky area because you have to weigh the pros and cons of the vaccine as compared to actually getting COVID. Getting COVID would be devastating. We are doing the only IC COVID research study. And what that study shows the 75% of the IC patients who get COVID report severe flares. 25% report extremely severe flares and do not respond to anything. And you're in a severe flare for months. And we, the reason why we think that's happening is we think you're getting an active viral infection in your bladder wall. So yes, some patients do flare with the vaccine, but generally it's a short-term flare. If anybody here on uh, Facebook or on YouTube, you wanna share your experience with it, that would be great. Hello, Jay on YouTube, nice to see you. Uh, Jeannie says, my IC was not affected by either my first or my second shot. My fibromyalgia on the other hand was. Uh, Cindy, Cindy says, I had my second a couple days. I was tired. That was it. There you go. So how y'all feeling today? How is life today? How is your IC? Mine is, you know, what's so interesting is that, remember, um, we have subtypes now. We've got five fundamental subtypes for IC. Hunter's lesions, bladder wall driven, pelvic floor driven, pudendal neuralgia, and central sensitization overlapping pain conditions. And, you know, now I know why I never responded to bladder therapies like DMSO, because fundamentally my bladder is healthy. You look at my bladder, there is nothing wrong with my bladder at all, even though I had extremely severe pain. Now we know that, that and now I know in my case, that my fundamental subtype is IC subtype five, chronic overlapping pain conditions, and IC subtype three, pelvic floor. And... It, you know, the this it, they're so fun. To, they're so similar that it's really hard to distinguish between bladder wall and pelvic floor. It's really, really hard to distinguish. Some of the some of the sensations is bladder wall pain is described as being like razor blades, ground glass in your bladder, whereas pelvic floor flares. I mean, pelvic floor pain is described as rather than being sharp and shrill, it tends to be dull and achy and have a burning quality to it. But, you know, I don't think I really ever paid attention as much to my urine flow. Like, um, if I think back in hindsight, now that I know that I'm pelvic floor driven, have I ever... You know, you know, you know, bathroom envy when you walk into a commercial bathroom and you're sitting in the toilet and you're just dripping, 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 and somebody else comes in and they're peeing like a horse, and you're like going, Whoa, God, I wish I could pee like that. Um, I'm doing that again. 
I haven't done that in years. Like I was always a stop and start girl, the stop and start girl where it was just challenging. Now my flow is so good. It's, it shocks me. And I think that that's really just because I have taken control of my pelvic floor. I'm really good at working with my pelvic floor now. Um, and so, hello, Medi from Denmark. I did not flare from my COVID vaccinations. Awesome. Ruth says she had two Pfizer shots, no flares. Uh, Anne says, so can you get flares with overactive bladder just like you can IC? And the answer is, yeah, absolutely. Because still there's something fundamentally wrong. And overactive bladder is 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 often kind of focused more on nerves, nerve irritation, nerve sensation, nerve sensation, the alpha afferent nerve being really irritated in the bladder wall. And so anything that's going to irritate the bladder wall and trigger those nerves is going to give you more frequency urgency. No doubt about that. Jeannie says, I'm having horrible burning and stinging when I go to the bathroom on the perineum. Urine culture came back as no UTI. It's been absolutely painful. So Jeannie, 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 it sounds like what you just described is what we call urine burn. So on the so there are two things we want to look at with that strong burning pain. If you're feeling like as you're peeing, your urine feels really, really hot and it's burning your skin as it's coming out like burning your vulva, burning your perineum, the very first thing we're going to look at is estrogen atrophy. We want to see what the hell is going on with, um, here, hold on a sec, that makes that a little bit better. Uh, we want to know what the hell is going on with your skin down there. Because if your skin is dry on your vulva, on your vagina, I mean, um, on your perineum, or even by your rectum, urine is going to be irritated. We call that the genitourinary syndrome of menopause. But the second thing we want to consider is the fact that immediately above the perineum is something called the perineal body. And the perineal body um, acts to uh, support four muscle groups. It's a, four, it's a muscle attachment point. And you know who talks about that is... In this book, Breaking Through Chronic Pelvic Pain. This is such a fabulous book. And this is a master class in pelvic anatomy. If your IC symptoms began after a car accident, uh, falling on your tailbone, uh, if you have a history of athletics, if you were abused, unfortunately, if there was some sort of physical trauma, if you suffer the muscle tear during childbirth, this book is a master class in pelvic anatomy and it will help you understand what could be going on. And this is the book. Let me see if I can find this picture. Yeah, I can find this picture right here. All right. So look, here is a picture from the, from the bottom up. And so here we have the rectum and the vagina and the, and I mean, the let's see, the rectum. Hold on, I gotta look at it. Okay. I have my, my screen shrinked really small. So my eyes don't move so much. Um, all right. So here we got the rectum, we got the vagina up there and in between the middle, you can see there's this little dot right there. That's called the perineal body. And the perineal body is often what starts to hurt. It's really quite interesting. So it could be a pelvic floor flare. Okay, you guys, I'm so freaking annoyed with these cameras. Hold on. Hold on. I, what can I do? Let's see. Okay, that, okay. Now there's a two inch. Woo, hanging on by a thread. Oh, okay. Woo, that's a little better. <laughs> if you can only see, I've got this camera set up behind my main uh, streaming computer, but I still have to look over here to see Facebook comments. All righty. All right. Okay. So, so uh, getting back to Jeannie. So here's the issue is the pyridium that they have you on is going to numb the bladder wall. It might numb the urethra a little bit, but it's not really going to numb the vulva or the perineum. 
And so again, if you got that dryness down there, you might want to think about using something like coconut oil. Uh, or if you're, you know, if your doctor is giving you that estrogen cream and you're not using that estrogen cream, that's exactly when you want to use the estrogen cream. Um, and you definitely, if you, if this is new to you and you've never had urine burn before, um, you want to make an appointment with your OBGYN and have them look at your skin and let's see where you are from a, an estrogen atrophy standpoint, because every woman goes through it. Let's see here. How do I find an IC doctor near me in Georgia? On our website, icnetwork.org, you can find a doctor database where you can search by zip code. So that's where you could start. I also happen to have another database. Let me open it up right here. Uh, that was given to me by Harvard uh, Medical School. That is another database of pelvic pain specialists. So we can look through that. We'll do, we can do that at the um, end of the meeting if you want. Um, Dr. Denise Pecht is outside of Atlanta. Pecht, P-E-C-H-T. She would be somebody reasonable for you to see. I've talked with her many times. Karen says, why do urologists not rec recognize the subtypes? Because only the top tier doctors around the world do. And it's this big competition. It's this big, and this competition has been going on for a decade now. It was the Europeans who first came up with their subtyping system, and they have 12 to 16 variants of IC using their system. In Canada, they use a system called Endpoint. And in the United States, we simply don't have a nationally agreed upon system. Um, however, that doesn't mean that different doctors aren't using their own subtyping system. And that is why I use the Chris Payne subtyping system, because I think it's absolutely brilliant. Um, uh, what the uh, kind of at the American Urology standpoint, the IC committee, and I haven't talked to them recently. The one thing they were prepared to admit is that Hunter's lesions are different from everybody else at that national level. Um, but there's going to be a lot of debating, a lot of elbow rubbing, you know, doctors trying to position to have their their approaches and their theories taught. So, you know, it is what it is, Karen. And that's why you have to walk in, even if they, they don't know the subtyping, you should know the subtyping so that you can say, all right, I would like to know, number one, do I have Hunter's lesions? Number two, do I have estrogen atrophy or some sort of chemical irritation? Number three, do I have any pelvic floor issues or is my pelvic floor tight? I can't start my urine stream right away. I've got a burning sensation, a pulling sensation, a pushing sensation, a prolapse, whatever. If you have pain when you're sitting down that is resolved when you stand up or you have sciatica, then you definitely have some pudendal neuralgia going on. And then if you've got the chronic overlapping pain conditions, that's really where you're going to find local doctors are not going to know the new stuff right now because it's so new at the national level. Uh, our uh, winter IC Optimist magazine went into why patients develop chronic overlapping pain conditions based upon the fall uh, 2020 International Pelvic Pain Society meeting. Okay, and guys, listen, you got to remember, so Diane here on Facebook says, I'm going through the same thing, said culture showed no infection, but I have the same symptoms as UTI. Now, here's the deal. Your bladder only knows one language, frequency, urgency, pressure, pain. The only way that your bladder can tell you that there's a problem is by giving you the symptoms of frequency, urgency, pressure, pain. So what does that mean? Is that everything feels like UTI. Uh, a bullet wound would feel like a UTI. A stab wound would feel like a UTI. Cancer would feel like a UTI. Frequency, urgency, pressure, pain is the only way that the bladder can tell you that there's a problem. And so it's very normal. We all thought we had UTI at first. We all thought we did. And we all went on antibiotics, some of us for long periods of time with no results. And there is a big group of people now who believe, still believe that IC is chronic bacterial infection. But what the federal research is showing, at least here in the U.S., is for some of us, there could be fungal infections, candida infections, and or viral infections. So don't put all your money in the bacterial basket. Sometimes it can be fungal or viral. And that's why we do the next generation DNA urine test not so much for the bacterial results, because again, the biome is very, I mean, it's meaningful, 
You know me, I like data. I don't like guessing. I like facts. I think the one reason why I like the next generation test is because it gives you facts. And one of the most important facts that it can give you is do you have a fungal infection? And again, it was our own MAP research network who made the connection between flares and fungal infections. So if you flare when you eat sugar, if you flare when you eat carbs, then in all likelihood, you could have a fungal infection. And that's where the next generation test really shines. If you want to learn more about the next generation test, you can go on over to bladderhealth.org and watch some videos from us, some doctors who use it. It's data. It's just data. Uh, Marcella says, Jill, you saved me. It was a terrible yeast infection. There you go. Marcella on Facebook. It was a terrible yeast infection that was causing my symptoms to be worse. I got the steroid cream and I stat. And like you said, thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah, baby. Woo! I love success stories. And she says, I still have some frequency, but I'm 90% better. There you go. There you go. Kathleen says, out of my dozen or so chronic illnesses when I was first diagnosed with IC, it was the first time a doctor had ever left the room so I could process what I'd been told. You know, the, you know, the problem is, is that IC is a grab bag diagnosis. There's no doubt about that. If they can't figure out why you have frequency or urgency pain, the odds are they're going to say you've got IC and they're going to give you the diet and, and give you Elmeron or something and show you the door. But, but We've come so far from that now. Now we know all of the different presentations that can trigger IC, the different, can, I mean, the presentations of IC and the different conditions that can trigger IC. So if you've just been diagnosed with IC, now we got to be in detective mode to try to really understand your anatomy now. So over on our website, we have an area on confusable conditions. So as an example, did you go through chemotherapy? Well, did you know that chemotherapy is known for causing chemocystitis, very similar to IC? Did you go through radiation therapy? Guess what? Radiation therapy can cause symptoms of IC. Do you have endometriosis? That can cause symptoms of IC. Do you have fibroid tumors? That could cause symptoms of IC. Do you have small fiber polyneuropathy? That could cause symptoms of IC. Do you have a Tarlov cyst? that could cause symptoms of IC. Do you have a broken tailbone? That could cause the symptoms of IC. So don't get obsessed with the name IC. Don't do that. In fact, I normally tell patients, don't walk into a new doctor's office and say you have IC. That is a mistake. You have to walk in and discuss your symptoms. Doctor, I have pain here on my left side about an inch from my rectum along with frequency urgency. Can you help me understand what's at that location that would cause this? Hi, Sarah. Um, or doctor, listen, I can't sleep through the night. I'm getting up every 10 minutes. Or doctor, when I sit on the side of a bed, I have immediate pain when I sit that gets better when I stand up. Or doctor, I have this really weird, I'm so embarrassed to tell you about it, but I kind of have this weird arousal sensation, but it's really painful and icky. Can you tell me what that is? That, of course, is um, a pudendal nerve entrapment or pudendal neuralgia. Then that's fixable. That's fixable with a um, uh, nerve block. All right. I even had that for about a, for about a month. So, so for those of you who are newly diagnosed, Kathleen in particular, this is now about going through a really extensive list of potential conditions to try to narrow down what is driving your symptoms. And when I work with patients over the over the phone, and, and you guys understand that I'm the longest serving IC support group leader, but I'm not a doctor. I can't give you medical advice. My, my job is to educate you, inform you, and then kick you in the butt and get you back to the doctor so that you can start asking questions of your doctor and let your doctor examine you. Since obviously I'm not in the position of being able to do that, nor should I do that. And so, and and also too, guys, the devil is in the details here. And that is what are the weird little symptoms? It's not just, I can't sleep. It's like, okay, why, where? Your ability to describe where it is is so important. Is it inside of your body? Is it outside of your body? Is it to the left? Is it to the right? What makes your pain worse? What makes your pain better? Um, um, can you describe the intensity of it? Is it sharp? Is it electrical? Is it dull? Does it have a burning quality? Your ability to describe these symptoms to your doctor will only make your diagnosis better in the long run.
absolutely better. Anne says, so overactive bladder has no subtypes. Um, you know, I don't, I'm sure, I'm sure that there is discussion in that circle about the different variants of overactive bladder. Uh, but I haven't seen, I don't read overactive bladder research very much, hon. So I, I can't, I can't say I've seen that off the top of my head. Is a diet similar to IC? Absolutely. Absolutely. Because whether you have overactive bladder or IC subtype one, hundreds lesions, or IC subtype two, bladder while driven, your job is to create an environment that will support healing. So the last thing we want to do is put something in the bladder, which is going to irritate it further. So we certainly do not want to be doing caffeine, which would amp nerves up. That's very important for overactive bladder. You And we certainly want to, wouldn't want to do things that are corrosive to the bladder wall and irritating to your bladder wall. And so, yeah, you got to follow the diet. Karen said, hey, Karen said, you know, I made myself a smoothie and I do not like it at all. I'm going to have to get some water. Yuck. Karen said, I saw a new Eurogyne who said my IC is more overactive bladder because I have a capacity of 450 cc's. My main symptoms are sensory urgency and pressure. He's recommending the Anoxix device, which is like Intersem, but has a longer battery life. I'm leery and confused. So the American Urology Association normally sets up treatments with respect to the risk of adverse event. They don't want you to do invasive therapies like neuromodulation until you've done the easy stuff. And the easy stuff are going to be very similar to the easy stuff in IC. Number one, improving your hydration, modifying your diet, trying some of the supplements that might calm some of these nerves down. That's the AUA. That's not me. That's the American Urology Association saying that. And, and, and treatment level two, step two, they're going to maybe want you to do ditropan, detrol, mirbatrig. In subtype three, they're going to want you to potentially do pelvic floor therapy if you've got some pelvic floor issues. Neuromodulation is in step four. So it's way too soon for Karen for you to be thinking about surgery. You've got to do the easy stuff first because the problem with neuromodulatory devices is that if the adverse events, there are a lot of adverse events associated with various neuromodulation. And I want to give a warning here. Um, so something absolutely stunning happened to uh, a patient a couple of months ago and I'm helping them right now. So it was a young man who went to a local hospital to have his first urgent PC appointment and urgent PC is the ankle stimulation, right? So rather than requiring surgery in the back, what they do is they insert an acupuncture needle uh, above the ankle and then they gently, emphasis on gently, uh, stimulate the nerves to try to calm the nerves down. So they went into a hospital with uh, a new care provider who, um, oh, sorry, um, who was just trained. I think this was her first uh, appointment with another patient and she made a terrible mistake. She told the patient that the more it hurt, the better it worked, which is exactly the wrong thing to do. If you're ever doing any neuromodulation, you never, ever, ever turn it up to the point that it hurts. We learned that 28 years ago. Well, somehow in her training, she misunderstood the instructions and she told the patient she was going to turn it as high as she could and he needed to take it. The more he took it, the better. And he immediately got very nauseous and complained and asked her to turn it down. And then he had a seizure, a very severe seizure. And now it's three months later and he's still having issues and we're connecting. We had to report it. It's been reported to the FDA. It's re been reported to the company. They've got to go back to that care provider, get slap them upside the head and say, what the hell did you do? And we got to get this patient better. So even the mildest, simplest neuromodulation can have complications here. And that's why the AUA says you got to do the non-invasive stuff first. So I certainly would not be considering inner stem or anything like that until you have progressed through the first steps of therapy. Sarah says, how are the Elmeron vision lawsuits going? I'm continuing to have diminished vision, wondering if there are any common links with the patients who have filed lawsuits other than Elmeron. 
Uh, the lot, we just did a Zoom meeting two weeks ago um, with uh, a group of attorneys representing and they gave a big update on it. They're proceeding quite well. There are kind of two different branches now with the Elmeron litigation. Uh, you've got the federal branch and then you've got the state branch. And so what happened is at the federal level, the original judge that was going to be assigned to the case was perfect known for being compassionate to patient needs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And they were ecstatic that they had this female federal judge who was going to oversee the Elmeron lawsuits. Um, after the election, she was offered a promotion, a substantial promotion. So she took the promotion and the Elmeron case at the federal level got transferred to another judge who is not as Uh, what 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 word did they use when they talked to me about her kind of, about him? Kind of kind of an old boy, you know, kind of old boys network. Um, and so so what happened is when the federal judge was assigned, a substantial group of attorneys decided to go the state route. They felt that the state route would give better results than perhaps a longer federal route. But then I've talked to attorneys on the federal side, and they're very optimistic with that because they've been given positions on the committee that's controlling the national case. So anyway, it's happening. I think there's over 200 cases now. I think that there is even more than that. Uh, they're being filed all the time. You guys need to know that your statute of limitations is probably running up. Uh, every state has its own st uh, statute of limitations. Normally that begins when you first learn of the potential problem or you first learn that you've been injured. And you might have one year, two years, or five years or longer um, uh, to file your case. And so make sure if you don't know what it is in your state, then if you can, go over to uh, elmeronlawsuits.org and, uh, or is it .com? Either elmeronlawsuits.com or elmeronlawsuits.org and uh, give them a phone call and you will be able to find out a little bit more information on that. Charla says, hi, Jill, I have an appointment with Dr. Chris Payne. What are your thoughts on how effective Elevil is for bladder pain and better sleep? Elevil is not a pain medicine. Elevil is an anticholinergic antidepressant. The way it works, so you, you, you want to make sure that you're not taking it like a pain medicine. Where So we've had some patients overdose on Elevil because they think that if they're in a flare, they're supposed to take more and more and more, and you don't do that. Um, and that's how you might be actually suffer some pretty serious side effects if you do that. Uh, Elevil is more known for calming the nervous system over time. And so it's about taking little amounts over time to gently and gradually calm the nervous system down. Um, it, it can certainly be helpful for sleep. Uh, many patients have found it helpful. The challenge with an anticholinergic medication like, like uh, Elevil is that um, it can cause dry mouth, dry eyes, um, incredible sugar cravings, and we call it the Elevil 20, where it's very normal for these patients, myself included, to gain 20 pounds. It just makes you, it makes you graze. It just makes you graze. Then the weight drops when you stop it, but it's an issue. And then last but not least, we have some pretty substantial research that now shows that if you take anticholinergic medications every day over a period of years, that, pre that presents a substantial risk of cognitive decline and or dementia. And so, Charlotte, I don't know how old you are, but you might want to talk to the doctor about you that you might be concerned about any issues with cognition and if there is a non-anticholinergic medication that they could recommend to you instead, right? Make sense? Gabby says, in Mexico, for the doctors, I see is equal to Hunter's lesions. There is no other type of assessment. There is no urine test other than the basic one. Well, so, so Gabby, uh, around the world, and the Europeans who were the ones who led this, um, patients with Hunter's lesions are usually diagnosed with IC. And if you don't have Hunter's lesions, but you've got all the other symptoms, you're considered to either have bladder pain syndrome or an Asia hypersensitive bladder syndrome. Here in the United States, we lump the two together. We call it ICBPS. And the reason why we do that is because we had great concern that if we stopped using the term IC, 
that some people would lose their disability benefits because we have, you know, we made a really good stride forward in getting the Social Security Administration to recognize interstitial cystitis as a potential disabling condition for disability benefits. And so the concern was that if we stopped using the term IC, that, um, that people would start saying, well, look, it's not a real disease. You don't use it anymore. Interstitial cystitis was never the right name to begin with. You know, it, it, it was what they knew 100 years ago, 120 years ago, 130 years ago. Today, I don't think they would ever describe this complex of syndrome symptoms of, of frequency, urgency, pressure, pain as interstitial cystitis. We would be have a if it were just uh, discovered today, it would be a much more specific diagnosis, like genitourinary syndrome of menopause or a nerve dysfunction or whatever. Hey, let me go get some water because um, I don't. This kind of upset my stomach, so I'm gonna go. Uh, let me go dump this out and get some water. I'll be right back. Which is weird. Good morning. Oh, my elderly mom is finally getting up. We let her we let her sleep late sometimes. All righty, let's go back to Facebook here. Teresa says, hurting, not sure if it's a bladder infection or IC, but I'm hurting just the same. So Teresa, can you describe your symptoms? You're hurting, but where? Tell us where. Is it inside of your body? Is it outside of your body? Is it sharp? Is it dull? Does it get better when you pee or does it get worse when you pee? Is it in your urethra? Carla says, I'm using a cream that is progesterone with a little estriol. I order it online. I don't know if it will work or not. Well, Carla, you have to have a doctor look at your skin, hun. You can't, you guys, listen, whether it's your pelvic floor or your, the health of your skin, you can't guess. You shouldn't be guessing. You really need facts. You need eyeballs on the tissue. And so if you're having burning on your skin on the outside, please get a doctor or a nurse practitioner to look at it to tell you to what degree you have, because you might be doing exactly the opposite thing you should be doing, hun. Um, and the same is true with your pelvic floor. A lot of patients are like, well, I, I'm just going to do kegels. No, no, you don't do kegels. Kegels will make it worse, substantially worse. And the challenge with you guessing like that is, especially if you have have a history of pelvic floor injury, is we don't know what structure is injured. And we need to know the muscles. We need to know, is it on the left side? Is it on the right side? Is it the levators? Is it the piriformis? Is it the obdurators? If you can just go once and have a proper pelvic floor assessment and then tell the, you know, tell the physical therapist, listen, I can't do this. I can't do this weekly. I, 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 I have money issues. We all have money issues right now. If you could give me some exercises and I will come back in six months and you can check my status. That would be great. But if you could at least get the names of the muscles that are involved, you can then go onto YouTube and look at some of the videos on YouTube about how to rehabilitate that specific muscle group. Remember, your pelvic floor is complex. you got muscles that go from left to right, front to back, low to high. And, and so therapy for a shallow muscle right here, it's going to be very different from a deep muscle up here. Lori says, have you heard of any patients prescribed overactive, overactive bladder medication for their IC, specifically Mirbatric? Yeah, absolutely. Because if you, you're struggling with frequent urgency and you don't want to do an anticholinergic, Mirbatric is the perfect option. The only challenge with Mirbatric is it's freaking expensive and often not on formularies. And so drug companies might want you to take 
a, a, a cheaper anticholinergic like diterpan or detrol, even if they know it can cause cognition issues because they don't want to pay for the mirbatric. But the Mirbatric really is the superior medication. And that is according to, who was it who told me that? Was that? I think that was Robert Evans at Wake Forest, the top IC doctor in the country. Charla says, how effective can lidocaine inst installations be for bladder urgency, frequency, and pain? Well, they're called rescue installations and they generally have Three fundamental ingredients are going to have a bladder coating, which is either going to be heparin or, or elmeron. It's going to have a numbing agent, either lidocaine or marcaine. And then it's usually going to have a little bit of sodium bicarb in it because the sodium bicarb will help it penetrate deeper into the bladder wall. The rescue installations are right now the most popular bladder therapy, uh, installation therapy in the IC world. Why? Because you can walk out of that doctor's office pain-free if the medication is working for you, right? If it's working for you. Uh, and you could be pain-free for several hours or a day or two with a rescue install. The protocol for rescue installations varies dramatically because a lot of doctors have their own custom formulas. If you come on over to the IC network, I have a whole page on all the published formulas for rescue installs and bladder installs. The protocol the, the, I think the most effective protocol that was published required, so let's say you're having a big flare and the flare is not getting better and you're doing diet and you're doing, you're doing ASO and all sorts of stuff like that. It's not working. You would normally call the doctor, ask for a rescue. And the protocol was three a week for two weeks. So Monday, Wednesday, Friday for two weeks. And, and the, the theory behind that is we're just trying to turn the nerve off. All we're doing is just we're chemically neutralizing the nerve, not neutralizing, we're chemically calming the nerve. And so three times a week for two weeks, and then once a week for four weeks, and then as needed. That was the published protocol for the Parson solution, for the Parson solution. Um, but then other doctors different, use different protocols. Well, they'll do it once a week for eight weeks, something like that. So, you know, if you've got IC subtype three pelvic floor driven, a, a bladder install is going to do nothing for you. If you have pudendal neuralgia, a bladder install is going to do nothing for you. If you've got Hunter's lesions, a bladder install is probably not going to help that much because Hunter's lesions need lesion specific therapy, uh, cauterization, laser therapy, steroid injection, hyperbaric oxygen therapy, or Lyris. Hunter's lesions don't generally respond well to installations. All right, let's look at Facebook here. Chastity says she's been dealing this since 2002. Girl, I got you beat because I first felt it in 1973 or four. Got you beat. Not that we're proud of that. It sucks. But again, now that we know these subtypes, now that we know these variants, we can focus on the better treatments for you. Like I go back to when seventh grade, when I had frequency urgency and urethral stricture, you know, their answer back then was to dilate the urethra and give you antibiotics. Today, it's very different. Now we're going to go, well, gee, why, it, why, why is her urethra narrow? Huh? Maybe it's a pelvic floor. And ironically for me, I had broken my tailbone in the same year that I first had frequency urgency. And I do believe going back in time, all of my symptoms were the result of this original pelvic floor injury combined with just being a redhead and having sensitive skin, which just made me feel pain, pain more intensely. I've talked about that in other meetings. Anne says, so what if all the UTI cultures are negative? Is this still overactive bladder? Of course. If your urine cultures are negative and you have a next generation test and that's negative, then sorry, then it's not culture. It's not UTI in any way. You've got something else going on. You could have, again, a fibroid tumor pushing on your bladder or endometriosis attached to your bladder or an, a tailbone injury or some sort of muscle injury. Chastity said, I always have blood in my urine. Hunt, there's a difference between microscopic blood versus peeing blood clots. If you're peeing blood clots, your toilet pink or red and you got dark red blood clots in there, then yeah, man, you got something serious going on. And that is always a visit to your doctor. You always call your doctor if you're peeing blood clots. 
But almost all of us have microscopic blood in our urine, and that's usually not worrisome at all. Um, and the reason why that happens is that when your bladder wall gets irritated, let's say you had a coffee and you've got estrogen atrophy and the coffee has gotten deeper into your bladder wall, you're, it triggers an immune response and your, your system sends white blood cells to the area because they think there's a problem. White blood cells are your army. They're there to fight whatever's going on. Only it's not UTI, it's chemical injury. So here we've got this influx of white blood cells flowing down to your bladder wall. And then what happens is because they're still in capillaries, the capillaries open and release the white blood cells into the tissue, but that also releases red blood cells. And that's why we often have microscopic blood in the urine. It, it's, it's always something you want to talk to your doctor about, you know, it, but it's not particularly worrisome. Um, unless you're peeing blood clots. But again, if you're concerned about it, talk to your doctor about it. They should be doing a urine cytology test to rule out cancer and all sorts of stuff like that. Jill says, me too, but they think it comes from my kidneys. That's another thing that can happen is yes, for some of you, there could be a kidney issue going on. Not it's kidney issues are rare, but there you go. Kathleen says, I refused Elmeron and glad I did. I have moderate success with aloe vera pills and marshmallow root. Power to you, girl. Power to you. Chastity says, what if you don't have triggers? For almost 20 years, I cannot pinpoint anything that triggers it. It just happens whenever. I wish I had triggers, then, then I could control it. Hey, Chastity, I hope you'll come into our Zoom meeting. I'll start that up in about 40 minutes because I'd love to talk to you more about that. Let's see if we can go back in time. Diane says, I study your website and watch your videos constantly, and they've helped me so much. I never knew the kind of soap I use mattered until I found a recommendation to swap to basis. What a a, a basis soap, what a blessing. Yeah. You know, again, if you've got estrogen, I was working with a patient on Friday, actually, it's really interesting because she did not understand as so many women don't, that as we get older, our skin gets drier and we lose that basic defense. You know, your mucous membranes are wet for a reason. That moisture is a barrier that protects the cells underneath. And so when your skin starts getting drier and drier and your vulva starts getting dry, then you're going to you're going to be a lot more vulnerable to irritation from urine and from menstrual pads, from fabric softener, from detergent and from soaps. And the best soap you can use is not is not a glycerin soap. Glycerin soaps are actually really quite harsh. You basis soap for sensitive skin is a really, really good choice, along with a plain dove unscented bar. Those are usually our choices. And of course, you always want to rinse with a peri bottle. And I knew one fell out of my shelf. I don't know if you can see this but a peri bottle and it has a squeeze top on it, fill it with water, leave it next to your toilet. Always rinse yourself off, then pat dry. Remember toilet tissue is not going to get the chemicals off of your skin, water will. So if you've got dry skin, you got vulvodynia, vulvar burning, perineal burning, rectal burning, one of the most important things you can do is just rinse yourself off with water before, before you, you pat dry. Barbara said she got an email about a trial for bladder calm. I think I heard about that. Um, so that was a company that called me a year ago, I think about a year ago, and they wanted to do, uh, they wanted to create another new supplement. And my answer was, we've already got really good supplements. So I just didn't, I, I didn't jump on that. I, 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 don't, I, I'm not, I think that was it, but I could be wrong. Let me look. Let me see if I can find it. It might not have been bladder calm. Could have been another product. Well, there's one called calm bladder. Yeah, that's not going to help at all, in my opinion. All right. So, yeah, so, um, you know, I had a, I had a company reach out to me some time ago and say they wanted to sit down and talk about creating some new supplements. And and it's like, you know what, we've got Bladder Builder. We've already got some really good supplements, al allopath, things like that. We just did our one year follow up study with Bladder Builder and the data was exactly what we hoped for. 
that 60% of the people who tried Bladder Builder responded favorably and that 20 to 25% were pain-free using Bladder Builder and the rest were reporting shorter flares, less painful flares, and fewer flares. So anyway... Melinda says, I'm having a lot of pelvic pain and burning. I'm having a procedure in two weeks. I go to a great urologist diagnosed you 20 years ago. So guys, if your symptoms, let's just say your symptoms started in your 30 and you got them controlled. And then all of a sudden they're coming back in your 50s. You have to consider the role of estrogen atrophy. That's, that's often why symptoms worsen for women as they get older is that your skin is getting drier, your bladder walls getting drier, your urethra is getting drier, and that's causing issues. Um, I love Jesus says, does MRI detect bladder cancer? Well, I think MRI would certainly detect uh, a tumor, but I don't know how subtle it would be. Uh, because bladder cancer can start on the surface of the bladder and then the best case scenario is you've got if is if you've got bladder cancer just on the very surface of your bladder wall, but if it grows and penetrates down deeper into the bladder and into the muscle of the bladder and even outside of the bladder, that's a much different situation. For those of you who know uh, who don't know, the number one cause of bladder cancer is smoking. Stop it! If you're smoking, for God's sake, stop it! Did you know? that children who get secondhand smoke in their homes will also demonstrate the symptoms we associate with IC, frequency, urgency, pressure, pain. Listen, those chemicals got to go somewhere. You breathe them in, they end up in your bloodstream, they end up in your kidneys, they end up being excreted into your urine where they can cause damage to the bladder. If you smoke, for God's sake, stop. You can do it. I believe in you. If you smoke, if you smoke a pack a day, come on, reduce it by one cigarette or two cigarettes a week. Get yourself off. It's your job to create an environment to support the healing of your bladder wall. We would hate for you to lose your bladder because you couldn't give up smoking. Uh, I love Jesus on YouTube says I love bladder rest the best. Awesome. Vera says, after 10 years of terrible pain, they finally diagnosed me with interstitial cystitis. Now doctors can't start the search for an appropriate therapy or can start the search. I'm a nurse from Belgium and it is thanks to you, I was able to gently push the doctors in the right direction. I hope I can help other patients with IC now. Oh, honey, Vera, you know, if there's anything that I can do to help, please, please let me know. I guess you do as a nurse have the capacity to help many, many patients. And, you know, we did a professional survey of IC patients and, you know, just to see if there were any correlations between work history as compared to IC. And, and what we found is the number one risk group were teachers. The number two risk group were nurses. The similarity in both those careers is you don't have restroom access. And if you're drinking coffee, if you're smoking, if you're you know, I was working with one nurse who hadn't had water at work in 20 years. She only drank that powdered, what the hell is that powdered drink um, with caffeine in it? They, all the nurses drank it. Um, and uh, yeah, there you go. So imagine she didn't have access to a restroom and she was holding this irritating urine for long periods of time. Of course, her bladder wall was getting very, very irritated. Tanya says, me too, fungal infection. Thank you, Jill. It's better, but still flare up from time to time. Walked around with a candida for years. I've already lost weight. I have an appointment with a rheumatologist because the lower back pain remains. Candida can cause damage there. Absolutely. Pamela says, great. I live with seizures. No way after brain surgery going back to that. Pamela, remember that is, I, listen, when this patient called me about her husband having a seizure with her his first urgent PC appointment, I immediately em uh, emailed Marshall Stoller, the guy who invented it. And I said, have you ever, ever, ever had a patient have a seizure? And the answer is no. Um, uh, the, the reason why this guy potentially had that seizure is because it was turned on massively. I mean, rule number one with neuromodulation is it should never hurt. And this, pa this whoever did it, this nurse practitioner, whoever it was, or medical assistant, turned it all the way up and told the patient, you got to take it. The more you take it, the better it's going to help you, which is completely wrong. 
And he suffered a terrible trauma to his nervous system because of that, in my opinion. They've got to do a lot more research to figure out why that happened. <laughs> Pamela says, he took Elmer on, did a Mona Lisa, had to have a vulva biopsy last year. The doctor asked if I'd been sunbathing in the, if you'd been in the sun. And she goes, sunbathing my vulva? No. <laughs> hey, listen, when you have vulvodynia and it's hurting down there, quite a few people have done, I, I might have done that a couple of times. Jackie says, what can help to sleep with IC? Jackie, if you come on over to our website, icnetwork.org, I've got a whole section and blog on, on sleeping solutions for IC. Remember that nighttime frequency, nighttime symptoms is usually a direct reflection of something that's happened during the day. If you're IC subtype one, IC subtype two, even IC subtype three. So if you're not following the diet during the day, then you're going to feel that nighttime irritation because at night you don't have distractions. During the day, there's a lot of distractions. So you might not feel how much your bladder's irritated until it's time for you to go to bed and you turn off your iPhone and your iPad and your TV and you're laying in bed and you finally go, oh, ow, that really hurts, right? Um, same, the same is true with muscle stuff. If you've done a lot, of, if done a lot of sitting that day or anything that would have tightened and triggered those muscles, you would feel it the most at the night, that first night when there are fewer distractions. And so if it's a bladder wall flare, you're going to have to do the bladder wall rescue protocol. If it's a pelvic floor flare, we got to focus on relaxing those muscles. Many patients go to bed with a, um, a heating pad uh, just to have a heating pad on your lower pelvis or on your lower back, just so that you can try to relax those muscles or using a muscle relaxant at night. That's very different than somebody with a bladder wall irritation. The bladder wall irritation, you're going to want to, number one, make sure you've drunk plenty of water to flush out what's irritated your bladder. Number two, you might want to think about doing something that will alkalinize your urine. So maybe taking a Tums or a Preleaf or a little tiny bit of baking soda and a glass of water, quarter teaspoon. Um, uh, and then you can go to the Azo bladder pain relief tablets, which are over the counter. Right, Azo, these are a staple. This is the over-the-counter version of uh, Pyridium. And then, you know, um, hopefully you will get, you know, a, a nighttime flare or flare from food, if you only did it once, might be a very short-term flare, right? It might just be an eight-hour flare, 10-hour day flare, one or two-day flare. But if you're drinking that cup of coffee every day, you're screwed. You're screwed because there's no therapy that can counteract the damage that a cup of coffee or soda does every day. Or God forbid you be doing green tea or, or you know, Bolt or any of those, you know, uh, caffeine drinks. Um, there's no therapy that can counteract the damage done by a cup of coffee a day. You have to give your bladder an opportunity to heal first. So generally what we say is lose the coffee for three months. And then we have a coffee, we have a coffee kind of rescue plan where, uh, you know, number one, you're going to start with hot water, hot water. See how you do with that. Should be fine. You can do milk. See how you fine. If you're okay with that, the next hot drink you're going to do is hot water with honey or chamomile herbal tea or peppermint herbal tea. See how you do with that. If you do okay with that, then you can go to a rubose tea. Uh, see how you do with that. The odds are you're going to be fine with that. Then if you do okay with the rubose tea, you can go to an herbal coffee like my favorite coffee right now. Dandy blend. Most of the herbal coffees are roasted chicory. And let's see, what is, what is this made of? I love this stuff. Uh, roasted barley, rye, chicory root, sugar beet, and dandelion. And it comes in, uh, you know, you just dump it out into your cup. I had two cups. I had a cup right before I went to bed. 
no flares. There's zero acidity in this and it's gluten free. So there's no acidity in this product at all. For, and, and it's really dark and rich and flavorful. you got to give it a try. It's really good. Dandy blend. Okay, if you do okay with the Dandy blend or the Ticino, which is another one, or the Caffrey Roma or the Pero, then you can try an herbal low acid coffee. And the herbal low acid coffees are going to be the Bella Rosa coffee, the Tyler's coffee, or the Simpatico coffee. And we have those in our store if you want to give it a try. Uh, I love Jesus says peppermint kills me. Yeah, for some people, peppermint's irritating if you have GERD. But she just says here that Dandy Blend is yummy. Yeah, man, this is good. I mean, I don't like Ticino at all. I find Ticino to be very irritating. I mean, not irritating, bitter. I find it to be very bitter. This is smooth. And and uh, put a little bit of sugar in this, a little bit of mocha mix in this. And boy, it's as good as a cup of coffee in my book. Go back to Facebook here. Ashley says she took Elevil for IBS. It helped. Got some. I took a. I took Elevil for about three months, but um, uh, it made me um, have a very irregular heartbeat. The challenge with Elevil is that it changes the. How did they describe it? Um, the conductivity of the nerves in the heart. And for me, you normally have two nodes in your heart that control your heartbeat. You got the SA node, and the AV node. And so your heart rate is beep, 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 beep. Well, after about six weeks of Elevil, my heart rate was beep, 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 beep. And that was because it activated a third node in my heart muscle. And it and it's way better. This was like 20 years ago. But um, it's still sensitive. If I do too much caffeine, my heart kind of freaks out. I mean, I, I don't do caffeine. I, I mean, uh, if I do too much decaf of anything, there's always a little tiny bit of caffeine in there. And it, it eventually triggers my heart. Donna says, I found it in July. My second bladder augmentation closed up. My bladder is now the size of a half dollar. My work is making us go back to, back to work after I have been working from home, girl, oh my God, Donna. So she has, so, okay, so Donna, this is your, so guys, for those of you watching, understand that everybody's different. The, the, the support groups are always going to be biased to people who are struggling for every person on online today having a bad day. You've got to remember that thousands are having great days. OK, so what happens to one person is not necessarily going to happen to you and rarely would it happen to you. You are a unique case of IC and you are a unique subtype. Some of you are hunter's lesions. Some of you are tailbone injuries. You know, some of you have central nervous system issues. So Donna here. And we, I don't know what Donna's subtype was, but she did have her bladder expand, bladder capacity expanded twice with a bladder augmentation. And so what they do is they take a piece of bowel and they attach it to the bladder to increase bladder capacity. But she's now had a complication from that. And understand too that surgery is now rarely used in the IC patient population. It is Those are step six treatment options. We only go to surgery if you failed everything else leading up to surgery. And if the bladder gets very, very small. So, um, so Donna now has to go back to work and a large group of people share a small number of bathrooms and a three stall bathroom. And your doc, your, your boss told you to wear a diaper. You're not the first person this happened to. I was working with a with a patient at, who worked at Sears in Texas, who was also refused. She was basically refused restroom access, which is illegal. Um, and her person told her to wear a diaper and pee standing while standing at the cash register. And so 
what I told her to do, and what I'm going to tell you to do, Donna, is you need to get your personnel policies and take a look at the written personnel policies and look at what they say about restroom access and look at what they say about disabilities. Um, I, you shouldn't be terrified to go back to work because if you're struggling with anxiety, you're just going to be peeing more. You've got to walk in from a position of confidence and knowledge. And I think the first thing we have to do is figure out what the actual real written policies are for your employer, because it may be that you've got a jerk of a boss who's just trying to push you around. So I would start first with what are the policies um, and then you could potentially ask for reasonable accommodation under the Americans with Disabilities Act. If you need restroom access, they should not be forbidding you restroom access. Even if you work on a factory floor there and you have to raise your hand and yeah, it might take a couple of minutes to get somebody in there. They should not be forcing you to wait 15, 20, 30, 40 minutes to use the restroom. That is in basic U.S. employment law. Um but the Americans with Disabilities Act might be able to help you because you could then say you need reasonable accommodation. And what that means is you need the opportunity to use a special bathroom. Maybe, you know, it depends upon the setting there. Maybe there's a manager who has their own bathroom and the ADA would allow you to request to use their rest, their restroom, like my dentist's office. My dentist, because I, I had a lot of dental work um, in the last four months, um, I had no idea that they had two restrooms behind the doors. We always had to go out and use the one outside. And then finally, I took my dad in, and he's 98 years old, and he had to pee every 30 minutes. And they let him use the, empl the employer's restroom, which was just like three steps away. So there might be something for you to do, hon. So I have a whole section on our website on the Americans with Disabilities Act. And honey, um, if you want to talk this week, I'd be happy to help you. Maybe we can find some other solutions for you. Bill says, I bought a bottle of Desert Harvest Alipiril pills. It turns out that it's only a two-week supply. How long should one take it? Well, hon, you know, um, I can, I can so go a couple of different ways in answering this question. Um, whenever anybody tries a new supplement, we always say start slow. We always say start slow. Take one of whatever it is for, and just take one and give it a try. I mean, after you've ruled out any allergy issues that might be on the label, let's say if you have a gluten issue or an issue with olives or avocados or whatever, or I'm, and those are not in aloe, but just to say, when you screen it, a supplement, you first look at the allergy information. And then even though the manufacturer might say the recommended dose is six a day or four a day, for those of us who are sensitive, we've learned never to do that. We've learned that it's usually best to start with one capsule and do a little mini tolerance test. See how you do with one capsule and then do one a day for a week. See how you do. Then you can go up to two, then you can go up to three, then you go up to four. Um, in pharmacology, there's a principle called the lowest effective dose. There's the highest effective dose and the lowest effective dose. And so with the lowest effective dose, what that means is what's the least amount of medication you can take to get a beneficial side effect. So that's a principle that I use for myself because I am so freaky sensitive to stuff. I, I, I have never gone to a full daily dose of any of the supplements. I can't. When I took Sister Protect, I could do uh, the manufacturer's recommended dose was four a day. I did one. I was okay. I did two. It gave me the runs and loose bowel. But when I did one, I was fine. And so when I was taking Sister Protect, I just did one a day. So you might be fine with one aloe a day or two aloe a day. The other thing though, that is worth talking about is on um, I use something called the Oxford Scale of Evidence-Based Medicine. And I use that when I'm evaluating information to bring onto our website because I want to bring reliable, credible information to our website, um, to my main core IC website, um, the main IC network website. Um, and in the Oxford Scale of Evidence-Based Medicine, they rate information from F to A. And F is information from a company trying to sell you something. And because why? Because they have an incentive to sell you something. 
A, a D is the opinion of one doctor. A C, oh, also in an F is a patient opinion. A D is a doctor opinion, not supported by research study. A C is a preliminary research study. A B is a better research study. A is a double blind placebo controlled study. So when I'm talking about, you know, our stuff, you, you got to understand that that when I'm a, I try to always be a support group leader first, even though I have a store, when I'm talking to you, I'm talking to you first as a support group leader and a, as a patient, but still I'm an F, I'm not a doctor. And even if I were a doctor, I'd be a D. We always want to go and look at the research studies behind that protocol, right? And so Desert Harvest Allo does have a, uh, a small double blind placebo controlled study that found effectiveness. And so that is a compelling reason perhaps to try desert harvest aloe. Um, ironically, the FDA no longer allows the companies to put their research studies on their website. So we are screwed now when we're trying to decide what to try. It's crazy. Uh, Lori, Lori says side effect of Mirbatric is UTIs. Um, I don't know why that would be. Uh, Lori, I have no clue why that would happen. Hi, Margie. Leslie says she uses trazodone to help sleep. Okay. Pamela says physical therapy had me doing Kegel exercises for years. I got worse. They push it. Yeah, you only do, you only do Kegel exercises if you're incontinent. If you have tight muscles, the last thing you would do is a Kegel exercise, which would just reinforce and further tighten muscles. Anne says, do they do bladder installations for erective bladder? They could. They could. Same install. It's going to be heparin, lidocaine, or something like that. Marlene says, uh, my specialist just put me on trazodone to relax muscles. I started pelvic floor therapy five weeks ago. Tremendous pain, never-ending flare. My superficial transverse perineal muscle is painful. Also got weekly installation of Elmeron for Hunter's lesions. Honey, Elmeron is not a treatment for Hunter's lesions. That's a bit of a waste of time. Uh, if you look at the AUA guidelines for Hunter's lesion therapy, uh, the lesions are supposed to be cauterized or lasered or injected with a steroid. Elmeron is not a treatment for Hunter's lesions. Um, groin pain could be the pudendal nerve. Trazodone seems to be helping third day on. Awesome. Sue says, I have UTI symptoms again. Doctor treated me with Cipro five days, four weeks ago. It came back. My doctor was really nice, sent me a microgen test, and it was negative Monday. Frequent urination, urethral burns, and urethral canal burns. Girl, if your next gen test was negative, then it's time to step back from the theory of UTI, and let's look at what else would make your urethra irritated. Estrogen atrophy. Tight pelvic floor muscles. If you got tight levator anal muscles, bam, that would be that could be one reason why your urethra is hurting. Remember, the bladder only knows one language: frequency, urgency, pressure, pain. Everything feels like UTI. Everything. A bullet wound would feel like UTI. Stab wound would feel like UTI. Bladder cancer feels like UTI. Estrogen atrophy feels like UTI. But you had the penultimate test. You had a next generation urine test and it came back negative. So based upon that data, you can walk away from the theory of UTI now. And let's look at other things like the quality and health of your skin. You know, that's the value of the next generation taste, uh, test. It's hard. It's just data. But it's good data. It's meaningful data. It's going to tell you what's in there. And if it was negative, then you can, you can now move on to other potential things that could be triggering your symptoms. Kalina says, can hemorrhoids cause pelvic pain? I used a little preparation cream on my hemorrhoids and it actually helped with the pain inside the vagina. I never had pain in the rectum area, so I'm confused. Girl, I use preparation H wipes. I love preparation wipes. I use those whenever anything is irritated down there uh, around the rectum, hemorrhoids, you know. I have no shame. I'll talk about anything. Yeah, I have hemorrhoids. So, um, Let's think for a moment about why hemorrhoids happen. Hemorrhoids happen because you're straining. You're pushing. You should never push to have a bowel movement or push to urinate. So if you're pushing, that tells me you have muscle dysfunction. That tells me that you've got pelvic floor dysfunction. And pelvic floor dysfunction is also often 
the trigger behind vulvodynia. And so, and the, and also the bladder. So you got to look at the underlying anatomy. If you got a massive case of hemorrhoids and you're straining, we know you have a muscle dysfunction going on. We got to work on those muscles. But why would preparation, preparation H cream help with bladder pain? Well, it would calm, you know, all the nerves are shared. You know, when those nerves meet at the spinal cord, they're actually shared. So the nerves in the bowel and the nerves in the bladder meet around L4, L5, and they end up in the same nerve group. So we have something called neurocrosstalk. So it may be that by calming the nerves around your rectum, you're also helping to calm and soothe the nerves around your bladder. It's a guess. Hi, Shell. Shell says, went to the doctor. She said, uh, the estrogen cream is not working well. It's starting me on tabs instead. Cool. Good. That's great. That's good to know. Uh, Bree says, looking for recommendations for trying to get pregnant while dealing with cystitis pain. Um, uh, Brie, we have a pregnancy resource center over on our website. Go to icnetwork.org and please check that out. Uh, you really have to do a lot of planning. Um, uh, you, you have to, there's a really good checklist on our website created by another IC patient. And it was kind of a pregnancy planning checklist. And I would encourage you to kind of work through that. We only have one research study that has compared bladder therapies and the risk of pregnancy it was done by Deborah Erickson at the University of Kentucky. We have that link on our website. I would encourage you to buy that article from the journal. Uh, we don't we don't sell the article. I had to buy the article too. I can't post it. You have to buy it from them. It might be 25 bucks. But it's the only study ever done that compared the risk of IC therapies with a potential pregnancy. And the one really meaningful um, message that I got from that is we want to try to avoid everything in the, in the first trimester, obviously. That's very, very important. But if the symptoms are returning and they're really significant and you're in your third trimester, um, they did talk about doing some bladder rescue and stills. Uh, but they discouraged the use of sodium bicarbonate because sodium bicarbonate would help that medication penetrate. And that's the last thing we want to do. We don't want the medication to penetrate up towards the fetus. So again, buy the article, read it, give it to your doctor, look at the, the other patient uh, diaries that are in there, and that will get you started. I see patients have babies all the time. Okay. For half, about half of those patients, their IC goes away completely. And for the other half, the IC gets a bit worse. So you got to have a good plan. Georgia says, does Tyler's coffee cause damage too? Tyler's coffee still has, even though he says it's no acid coffee, and the one coffee test that I saw with it, it did have a little bit of acid in it, whereas the Dandy Blend had no acid in it at all. So, I mean, you can try it, see how you do. Kristen said, I've been drinking low sodium beef broth instead of tea in the morning. It's surprisingly satisfying. Cool. That's a great suggestion. Jean says, what is my view on bladder removal? Bladder removal is extremely rarely done. I remember when I first started my support group here in California, in the first six months, I was working with an elderly woman up in Ukiah who did have her bladder removed. And she was stunned that the pain didn't go away. She thought, the, if you had your bladder removed, the pain would go away. And we understand why that happens now because we have subtypes. If your pain is coming from your central nervous system or nerves or muscles, removing your bladder is not going to fix it. So if you're at the point where you're thinking about removing your bladder, you have to take a step back and do a really exhaustive review of other potential triggers first, because I would hate for that to happen to you too. She was devastated. She really thought bladder removal would fix it all didn't touch her pain because her pain was not coming from her bladder. Her pain was coming from something else. And I have a whole section on our website about it. Also on our support forum, we have a bladder removal support forum run by a woman who uh, had her bladder removed. And that's a place where you can get some good information there. And I'd be happy to talk to you too, Jean. If you're, if you're really at that point, 
you know, I'd be happy to talk with you on the phone and kind of work through some stuff and give you maybe some questions that you can ask your doctor. Valerie says, if antibiotics help, there is an infection. That is not true. Antibiotics also have a nice anti-inflammatory effect. And so you sometimes the reason why you feel better on an anti antibiotic is because of that effect. It's not killing anything. So that's not true, hon. Shell says, it's really tough. I haven't had a pain-free day in months. I get discouraged. Yeah. Arachne says, your idea was very good on the hormone suppositories. Thank you. Your bladder is very happy. Shell, talking to family and friends is hard, hon. It's just really hard. You know, because they remember, it's the same with a doctor. The, when a doctor is diagnosing you, they're looking at your body. They're, they're considering their knowledge, but they're also focusing on their own personal experience. And if they've never had severe bladder pain, they don't understand how, what it feels like. You know, that's, and so that's the same is true with your family. They've never had this before. They don't know what it feels like to have what feels like the world's worst bladder infection, slicing your bladder in the middle of the night. They have no clue. And you can describe and describe and describe and describe, and they will never get it because they've never had it. They've never had it. And so at some point in time, you just have to kind of back off and say, listen, you can't see it, but it's there. And don't expect them to be able to say exactly the right thing because it takes another person who's been up all night, crying all night, begging for God to help them, who truly understands what you're going through. Truly, truly. That's why having some IC support buddies is important. One of the mistakes that some IC patients make is their spouse goes to work, they're at home, they're having a rough day. And as soon as their as spouse comes back, they unload. It's like, oh my God, it was so bad. I just stay in bed all day. I was crying, you know, yada, yada, yada. And you're here, your spouse is just, you're looking to them to say exactly the right thing to you, but they will never be able to do that until they've had it. And that's why you have to have support buddies. Don't drop that load on your spouse. This is where having some icy friends that you can call and say, oh, my God, I ate black bean soup. It killed me. Oh, my God, it was so bad. And that person can say, yeah, it happened to me, too. But if you say that to your spouse, your spouse is going to go, huh? I don't know. Pamela says, I have a restroom access card. Yes, we do have restroom access cards on our website that you can buy. It's three for three bucks, something like that. It's really cheap. Let's see if I have one. Here they are. So medic alert card. Uh, and you can carry this in your purse so or, you know, your wallet so that if you need to use a restroom, you can and they won't let you. You can whip this up. Um, if this isn't good enough, you can actually get a medical alert bracelet, which is what I did for when I was on planes back then. Uh, but just having something like this will give you a little bit of confidence and comfort. Then the other card that we have that you can carry around with you is our diet card. Look at that. Foods to avoid foods usually bladder friendly. And, and this is really good to give to family members if you're going to be, you know, eating at their house, maybe potentially if you're not bringing in your own food. Uh, Arachne says, have you ever heard of microplastic failing because it is absorbed and flushed out of the body? They will do it ag again with a hydrogel, which is supposed to be new. Uh, I don't have experience with, with that. I don't know. Marlene says, would terrible pain after bowel movement be pelvic floor? Yes, probably, possibly. Pain after bowel movement, especially if you're straining, we're definitely going to be looking at tight pelvic floor muscles. I mean, we've all done that. I remember doing that in my, like, when I was in college, because, you know, one of the things that happens when you go away to college and you're eating at the, you're eating at, uh, at the commons for the first time is we don't act, we don't go for the high fiber foods. We go for the pastas and all the stuff like that. And it's very common for new pay, new students at colleges to become massively, massively constipated, which did indeed happen to me. 
And I went to the commons because I was having such bad cramping. And he did an exam and he goes, Jill, you are massively constipated here. And it's like, I know. And, and, you know, and so you're, if you're straining because of that situation, you can actually feel your muscles strain and start to cramp. I remember I had to kick my roommate out of my room one night because I had to do a fleet enema, but I was too embarrassed to tell her what I had to do. And she was so pissed off at me. I was so embarrassed. Roger says, I had a cystoscopy in January because my doc thought I had a stricture, but I didn't. Everything looked normal. Now I'm in a lot of pain three months in. Can a cystoscopy cause chronic pelvic pain syndrome? Uh, it depends on if it was a hydrodistension with cystoscopy as compared to a cystoscopy. If it was a looky-loo, five-minute test, stick, the, stick it in, take a look around, pull it out. Five minutes, you're done. We really wouldn't see bladder damage with that. But I think that a man that's being catheterized goes through a bit more irritation um, than women do because your urethra is so long. And if it was super, super painful and they and or they used a, a, a wide catheter or a wide cystoscope, then that could have triggered some pain. He said that's the worst pain I've been in. Yeah, you know, we do better with um, when you have tight pelvic floor muscles or you've got a really tender, vulnerable urethra, um, you want to always use small catheters, pediatric catheters. If they shove a, shove a big wide catheter in there, it hurts like hell. And so, you know, uh, could they have done some superficial damage to your urethra? Maybe, but that should have healed by now. I'm more interested in what's going on with your pelvic floor, hun. Um, because if your bladder wall looked normal, then we have to look outside of the bladder and what else can we consider? And I'm going to say the great majority of men that I work with, we find a pelvic trauma, a pelvic floor trauma, like you jam your crotch in the bar of a bicycle, something like that. So Roger, can you think of any traumas that happened to your pelvis or were you sitting for a long period of time or did you fall on your tailbone? Anything at all like that? Kayleen says, what are hyaline casts? I don't know. Let me look. I, I don't know, hun. I've never heard that within the context of a discussion about IC. Soledad says, what are Hunter's ulcer symptoms? Are always the same for everybody? Uh, Hunter's ulcers are, are going to be, also known as Hunter's lesions, are going to be extremely painful. And these are patients who are going to have a lot of blood in their urine, either microscopic blood or more likely visible blood. So the patients with the worst pain are often the patients with Hunter's lesions because they're big bloody wounds in the bladder. You're going to be extremely diet sensitive when you have Hunter's lesions. You're going to, you're not going to be able, many Hunter's lesion patients are down to eating five or 10 safe foods because their bladder is so reactive to food because of the wounds. And that's why it's so incredibly important that they treat the lesions quickly. And the greatest tragedies in the IC world are patients who are told they have Hunter's lesions, but they don't treat them. When Hunter's lesions are treated, the pain improves dramatically, like 85%, if I remember the last research study correctly. So were your lesions treated, hun? <clears throat> You know, Sue, Sue's asking about supplements and Sue, it, no, nobody can tell you what's going to work for you. It's going to be trial and error and kind of based upon your symptoms. So the marshmallow root, it might be calming and soothing to your bladder. The D-manos, you would only do if you have an E. coli based bladder infection or you're prone to that. And so, you know, I think you just have to pick one and give it a shot. Hi, Aaron. Nice to see you. Marisol says, my IC is more of a painful bladder, um, but she also says, uh, forget about lifting, pulling, pushing anything heavy. A full gallon of milk is heavy for me. 
I uh, started using Bladder Builder and System End, and oh my gosh, this has been a godsend. It has helped tremendously with my painful bladder. I'm so grateful, and I pray the effect doesn't wear off. Um, I haven't had to use the Azo. There you go. Well, hun, if pushing and pulling triggers pain, then we always have to look at your muscles. I would want to know what's going on with your muscles, and is there anything that can be done to try to improve that? Roger says, I've been going to physical therapy with relief, few and far between, but this pain started after the cystoscopy, so I don't think it's a coincidence. I think it caused trauma. Well, you know, the, so again, Roger, was it a hydrodistension with cystoscopy or was it a cystoscopy? Did, was it done in the hospital? Or was it done in your doctor's office? And did they put water in your bladder first? That's important. Do you remember? So it was only a flexible cystoscope. They did not, he did not use water first to stretch your bladder. Okay, but he did, did he put water in your bladder? You guys, for those of you on Facebook, um, uh, Roger's on YouTube. So when he did the cystic, okay, you don't think so. So, and you said that having the cystoscope was the most painful thing you'd ever been through, right? So I would wanna know where that pain was. Was the pain at the tip of your penis? Was the pain in your urethra or is the pain up in your bladder? So where is the pain located? At the tip of your penis, in your urethra, or is it up in your, above your pubic bone in your lower belly? Marlene says, is hydrodistension a good option? Hydrodistension is a step three treatment option. Uh, it's what I call a destructive therapy. Uh, it doesn't build anything up. It actually breaks things. And that's why you feel better. It breaks the nerves when you stretch the bladder. But unfortunately, the nerves always grow back. And sometimes more nerves are, grow back. So hydrodistension is not considered uh, a repetitive therapy. All right. So Roger, getting back to Roger, his pain is below his belly button. It's not in his urethra. Okay, so we know that um, instrumentation can damage tissue. If they push it in too far, they could have pushed it against the bladder wall and maybe wounded the bladder wall, but I would have expected that that might have healed if that happened. When they did you ever bleed after this was done? Was there blood in your urine after you had this done, Roger? Aaron says, if food doesn't bother you so much, should you still avoid those foods? No, I think you know you can do uh just slowly work your way back up if food isn't triggering you then then that means your bladder's doing well all right so getting back to roger here he had no bleeding so that tells us then that your bladder wall was not superficially injured during the procedure if they had ruptured your bladder you would have been sent home with a foley catheter for a couple of weeks so says just pain like an upset stomach except it's an upset pelvis you know when you're in pain what happens is your muscles get tight to protect you from that pain so I have to wonder if it triggered a pelvic floor spasm it could have triggered a bladder spasm or a pelvic floor spasm when you went to pelvic floor physical therapy what did they say about your pelvic floor muscles anything are your muscles tight what'd they say and you guys, we're going to be starting our Zoom meeting in five minutes. Uh, Corianne says, is it true you can have ulcers that they won't find during a cystoscopy with hydrodistension? Not usually. It depends upon the experience level of the doctor doing it. Uh, it would be pretty hard. I mean, 
Uh, in the European guidelines for IC, they, they specifically talk about the lack of expertise in doctors not recognizing Hunter's lesions. Hunter's lesions can be round or they can be vertical. They can look like cracks. And so it is possible that a doctor might not recognize the Hunter's lesion. All right. So getting back to Roger, Roger says they are definitely tight. Okay. So the next question that I would ask you, Roger, is when is your pain? He says, but they were tight before the cystoscopy and I was, I was never in pain. Okay. So Roger, let's try this a different way. Does your pain change when you pee? When is it the worst? Before you pee or after you're done peeing or while you're peeing? So when is your pain the worst? Before you urinate, when your bladder's full, while you're urinating, or after you're done urinating? When is your pain the worst? Vicki, we're doing we're doing extended questions, but I'm going to start the, the, the Zoom meeting up shortly. Tabitha says, will D-Manos help a UTI? Not from E. coli, no. Not that I know of. D-Manos was found to be specifically helpful only for E. coli. Okay, you get a bit of relief after you're done peeing, but the pain eventually comes back. So Roger, um, there is something known as the chicken versus the egg dilemma. Which comes first, the chicken or the egg? And for us, it's which comes first, the bladder or the pelvic floor? The reality is that they're both involved. Why? Because they're so interconnected. It's, it's almost impossible for you to have bladder issues with not having, without having some muscle issues and vice versa. So for some patients, this whole pelvic pain syndrome begin, it can begin with an organ trauma, with a muscle trauma. I'm sorry, let me take that back. For some patients, it can begin with a bladder trauma. Let's just say chemotherapy. If your symptoms began after chemotherapy or your symptoms began because you were drinking a lot of energy drinks, uh, you were working long periods of time, trying to keep up massive amounts of caffeine, in both circumstances, we're looking at chemical irritation of the bladder wall. That's very common. And because your bladder wall is irritated, your muscles are going to get tight to protect you from the pain. That's called the guarding reflex. So our therapeutic priority for the chemo patient is to calm and soothe the bladder. And if we calm and soothe the bladder and get rid of the chemical irritant, then we know the muscle should eventually release. So that is our treatment protocol for that chemo patient. But what about the patient whose symptoms began with muscles? Now you have no clue you have a muscle problem. Your first symptom is frequency urgency. You call the doctor and you say, hey doc, I think I have a prostate infection. Or I have something or an infection. The doctor goes, yeah, it's probably prostatitis. They throw you right on antibiotics. They don't work. You go back to the doctor. Say, listen, it's still here. And the doctor goes, oh, let's try some Flomax. Let's try some prostate meds. They don't work. You go back to the doctor. The doctor goes, all right, we got to take a look. We're going to look for benign prostate hyperplasia. We're going to see if, you're, going to see if your prostate is pushing into your urethra. They do a cystoscope. They take a look. And, and that's not there. And your bladder looks pretty good. And you go back to the doctor, you know, the pain is continuing. You're still frustrated. You've been on antibiotics for, in some cases, months and months and months. You've been on the prostate medications for months, if not years, and you're not better. Why? Because if your symptoms began with a muscle injury, as for many guys it does, whether you are a paratrooper or you're on a long motorcycle ride or you worked in a steel mill, um, uh, our therapeutic priority for the muscle patient is to restore a blood flow. Why? Because that's what happens when you have tight muscles. You get ischemia, you get oxygen deprivation, de uh, nutrition deprivation to the bladder and to the other organs. And so for this muscle injury patient, you can be on bladder therapies for years and you will never get better because it doesn't address the fundamental Abnorm physical abnormality, which is poor blood flow from super, super tight muscles. So our therapeutic priority for these men is to restore blood flow. How do we do that with pelvic floor physical therapy? So one is the viscerosomatic reflex, which is the, the bladder changing your muscles. And the other is the viscerosomatic the viscero or the somatovisceral reflex, which is 
muscles changing bladder function. What does your doctor say about that? What did your doctor say? I would want to look at, I would want to get a copy of your medical records. I would want to get a copy of what, what notes does he have in there about what happened with the procedure and what size they used. I mean, it's a, it's a mystery, but we have one, one clue here. And the clue here is that your muscles are definitely tight. So if they're tight, you've got ischemia. And so you got to work on the muscles regardless. But I, you know, and the fact that your pain is up by your belly button, listen, your bladder is much lower than that. Your bladder is down by your, you know, down by your pubic bone. You've got more muscles up by your uh, belly button. So I don't know. But here's what we do know, and that is you didn't pee blood afterwards, so the bladder wall itself didn't get torn or cut during the procedure. I would suspect that your muscles, because it hurt stretching your urethra, your muscles just locked down big time, and they're probably still pretty locked down. Did you ever try a muscle relaxant? Did the physical therapist suggest perhaps using a muscle relaxant? That'd be a good question to ask your physical therapist. Hawk says on Facebook, uh, comment on Hunter Solutions. I had them taken care of at a university, university of Penn on March 4th after some bleeding and passing blood clots. I've had 37 days of no pain and your voiding is normal. Dude, yeah, there you go. That's why we treat Hunter Solutions. Rod, he said he simply diagnosed me with chronic pelvic pain syndrome. I'm 31 years old, no alcohol, no caffeine. I was pain-free before the procedure. Yeah, but dude, why did you were there for a reason? Why did they do the procedure in the first place? I mean, what was your symptom before that? You can't you can't just say that the procedure caused it. You were there having that test because there was a problem. It's just, you know, trying to figure out the contribution is very very hard. Marlene says, my psoas muscle near my belly button is affected by my pelvic floor. So is mine, but I feel that more in my lower back. Vicky says, if I'm getting a uterine prolapse, can that cause icy symptoms? It could, depending upon the degree of the prolapse, son. It could, especially if it's the prolapse is uh, affecting the bladder's ability to drain. Then it could cause some issues. All right, let me start up the Zoom meeting. So give me one quick sec. If you want to come in and talk to me directly and be a little case study in here, why don't you come on into the Zoom meeting? To get there, you're just going to go to our website, icnetwork.org, and click on the stream support group meetings under support, and then just click on Zoom. That's what I'm doing right now to start up the meeting. All right, the meeting is now started up. And let me get the invite. All righty. All right, so YouTube, there's your invite to Zoom. And Facebook, let me give you the invite to Zoom. Hold on a sec. You're on a different computer, my friend, so. Ah. My mouth, oh, no wonder. All right. All right, hold on a sec, Facebook. Let me get you that invite. My neck is so tight. Oh my God, you guys. I have been, we're on the final layout of this new book. 
called IC101. And uh, I've been working on it like mad. Let's see, hold on a sec. Well, my neck is ridiculous. So if you see me doing my little, my little tremor thing, don't worry. It's just what happens when I work on the computer too much. My neck muscles are like beef jerky. Not pretty. All right, Facebook, bam, there you go. There is your invitation. All right, so Michelle is coming in. All right, Michelle, hold tight, hon. Okay. Thank you, Aaron. <sighs> Marlene says, thank you for everything. You're very welcome. I'm a little befuddled today in the sense that um, I worked really late last night and then I had to take a, and I'm sleeping right now in my recliner in my family room because my neck muscles are so tight that it's messing with my TMJ, uh, but it's getting better. A week, a week sleeping on the recliner. Okay, Roger says, I did a urine flow test because of frequent urination. My bladder was too full at the time of the test stream. Wait, wait, wait. My bladder was too full at the time of the test, so your stream was slow and inconsistent. The doctor thought I had a stricture, but I did not. Yeah, but if if you couldn't, so, so Roger, the hallmark symptom of somebody with tight pelvic floor muscles is when you go to pee, you can't start your stream right away, that you're hesitating 5, 10, 15, 20, 30 seconds before you can relax enough to empty your urine. So it sounds like that was going on. I mean, there's good, there's good news here, and that is your bladder wasn't physically damaged. So we have to think about the likely the likely consequence and that is because it hurts so badly your muscles just lock down and that's what's causing your pain that's a possibility that's a, a probability but you know i'm not god i can't i i'm guessing here and and i'm not a doctor i can't give you medical advice my job is to open doors for you and so I, my, the door that I, I would open two doors for you. Door number one is back to the physical therapist. And door number two might be to a second opinion to another urologist to see if there might have been any other weird complication. I, uh, I really can't think of anything, hon. I just can't. But it's the guarding reflex. He goes, I acknowledge I had pelvic floor problems before the cystoscopy. Well, why am I in pain after the cystoscopy? Because cystoscopies hurt. When you stretch the urethra, it hurts. You know, um, and it, depending upon the size of the cystoscope they used, I mean, it could have really stretched you and traumatized you down there. And now, you know, it just reinforced muscle tension. So you had pre, you had a level of muscle tension, then you had another triggering event, a severely painful event, and your muscles went from partially tight to bam, locked down. And so an interesting experiment would be potentially using a little bit of a skeletal muscle relaxant, like baclofen or flexoril. You could ask your urologist or your doctor if, if uh, or the physical therapist, if they would be willing to give you a, a muscle relaxant to see if that would reduce some of the pain. It was, it's a viable option. All right, so guys, we are in the Zoom meeting now. Um, and so if y'all wanna come and talk to me, that's fine. If you don't, that's okay. We're gonna, I'm leaving uh, Facebook open. I'm leaving YouTube open. Uh, so people are gonna hear you, but they're not going to see you. Um, Roger said he tried Valium, but it did not hurt. It did not help. Did you just take one or did you do it consistently over a period of time? 
I mean, honestly, I think a visit to a physiatrist would be a really good, a really good idea for you, Roger, because, and again, the book you really want to think about getting is this book, um, uh, Breaking Through Chronic Pelvic Pain. It's a master class in pelvic anatomy. And one of the things that Dr. Weiss talks about in this book is why do some patients stay tight? Why do they just consistently stay tight? tight in some patients, regardless of what you do. And that's when we have to look at, at bones, because what puts pressure on muscles but bones? Is there a bony structure abnormality? Um, we, for example, last, uh, last summer had a new study that showed that 70% of the men with testicular pain had an underlying hip problem, that it was all bones and muscles driving the, their testicular pain. Oh, wait, you, you just took one pill, but you hate taking meds. We'll consider more. It, it's, you know, there's something in your daily life which is keeping your muscles tight. It could be you're sitting too long at work. It could be that you're riding a bicycle. It could be that you're under a lot of stress. It could be that you've got a bad hip or a bad knee or a bad foot. But one pill is not going to fix that. Right. You got to be real here. And, and and I mean, I take with my long term pelvic floor issues from my SI joint, a quarter of a flexural at least four nights a week right now just to try to calm things down. Take the, I don't take the whole pill. I take a quarter of a pill. But I find personally that trying to keep those muscles relaxed is really critical for me getting better. So I Roger, I'd be happy to talk to you at some point in time. I got to switch over here to uh, to Zoom. All right, so Michelle. Hello, Michelle. Michelle, can you unmute yourself? This guy, let's give her a minute. Michelle, Michelle, Michelle. She might have just gone to make a potty break. All right. Uh, Lauren, you want to unmute yourself, Lauren? There you go. Hey, girl, how you doing? How is life today? Okay, wait, 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 hold on. I cannot hear you. So Lauren, you're unmuted. Can you just say something like do testing one, two, three, four? Here, hold on a sec. Let me, uh, uh, that's not going to work. Um, cannot hear you. Here, hold on a sec. Let me, just out of curiosity, Chimera says, do y'all provide scripts or instructions that we can purchase to assist us in asking our insurance covers? Um, well, that's a great idea. Uh, uh, if you go on over to our website and go to the physical therapy area, you will certainly find all the research that you can download to build your case for physical therapy. Okay, Lauren. Hi, can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you now. Okay, good, good. Um, you know, I have a question. Yes. Um, so I've been doing my installations. It's not the first time I've done them. I've probably done them twice in the past six years. Okay. Um, but I'm doing my rounds. I have like two more to go and, um, the nurse practitioner does it. So when she leaves, she's like, okay, I can't dismiss you till the doctor comes in and the doctor peeks their head in. They're like, you're good. Okay. Bye. So I had this new doctor. Um, she doesn't know me. She doesn't know my chart. Um, and she came in, I brought this up to you before, but, um, I had another issue this week and I asked about the Elmeron and she's like, I wouldn't prescribe that to a, um, a family member. She's like, plus you don't want to lose your, all your hair. Now I've been on it for six years. I lost a little hair, not much, but a little. Um, and I think it does help because I can live a normal life and raise my, my daughter and be a wife, um, that I couldn't do, you know, six years ago for two years. 
Um, so when she came in the last time, she I asked her, I was like, listen, I'm, I'm really concerned with the Almoran. I'm thinking of going off of it um, after my installations and starting with all the, you know, the bladder builder, the aloe vera. And she was like, did you ever think it interests him? I'm like, well, I've read about it. She goes, you, you might be a good, cat, uh, a good you know, person for that. And I'm like, well, could you tell me about it? She's like, well, who's your doctor? And I told her, she's like, she doesn't do it. I do. So, um, but bring it up to her. And I was like, okay, but I'm kind of like, it, it has me so confused because I said, um, why am I still being prescribed Elmeron? I just got an 11 month refill. She goes, well, only 5% of people get it. So now, you know, the eye disease. So in my head, I'm like, well, 5%, hmm. I, I might be able to deal with that 5%. But the interstem, I was under the impression that it doesn't help so much with pain, that it was more like urinary frequency and, um, you know, urgency, mm -hmm. which my IC is, is, is very hard to really explain mine. In the beginning, it was off the walls. I was misdiagnosed and, and told I had an overactive bladder and I could only hold 80 cc's of, of fluid, urine. And when I look back at my old records with all the old doctors I've been to, I'm like, well, I probably could only hold 80 cc's because I was inflamed at the time. And I was pretty much, you know, um, I don't know. I, I was just inflamed. And I, I bet if I went back and had that procedure done now, I could probably hold five, six, seven hundred because I could go without going to the bathroom for five, six hours. So and I, I never, ever burn what I pay. The problem is, is the pain and the instant fill up I feel. But I could ignore it because I know it's false. Do you, do you know what I mean? It's not like if I was to go to the bathroom and then stop. Ten minutes later, I kind of feel that filling up very slowly. But if I go to the bathroom, nothing will come out. It's, it feels like it's more neurological, um, from in that sense. So my IC is like very hard for me to fully describe. But well, okay. all of this stuff being thrown at me in, at once is okay. like it's so confusing. I know. Has my head like just in a whirlwind of what's my next choice? Right, and you're kind of mixing apples and oranges and pineapples in one piece, and we just can't do that. We can't do that. Yeah. So let's think for a moment about what we do know. And that is that when you have a bladder coating, you are pretty much symptom free, right? Yes. Okay. And so what physiological problem is a bladder coating solving? It's solving estrogen atrophy, right? How old are you? 43. Okay. And have you uh, had a hysterectomy? Are you? No. Okay. Are... I, I take birth control because it helps. It helps with my flares. Like I would normally flare ovulation all the way to the end of my period. So I take birth control and now I only flare like two days during my period. Okay. You're not understanding the anatomy and that's what you have to do to try to be able to make good decisions here. So your blad so think about your bladder for a moment. Your bladder is the only organ in your body designed to hold toxic waste because urine is body waste. Urine contains ammonia and urea and all sorts of irritants. So how can the bladder hold ammonia for hours at a time and not get damaged? Well, it has what we call the mighty mucus. Your bladder is like your mouth. It's a hollow organ covered with a really thick coating of that mucus. And the purpose of that mucus is to protect the cells. It's to protect the cells from infection and it's to protect the cells from irritants in your urine. Now, okay. that, that mucus is estrogen dependent. So when you're young and you have lots of estrogen, you have lots of mucus. When you're older or when you're on birth control, you have less estrogen Therefore, you have less mucus. And we just had a very interesting research uh, case study published last year of an 18-year-old woman who suddenly experienced icy symptoms. And they got worse and worse and worse over a period of, an, of a year. She saw four or five doctors. She was diagnosed with IC, with UTI, with candida, with 
uh, you know, a host of issues, right? And it was the fourth or the fifth doctor that she saw who said, hey, you didn't by chance start birth control, did you? And she gets, yeah, two weeks before she developed the onset of her symptoms, she had started oral birth control for the first time. So they had her go off the birth control. And what do you think happened? Her symptoms went away. She healed. It took two months, but she healed. So birth control restricts estrogen. And when you restrict estrogen, you are restricting mucus even more. And so, yes, okay. you're not fla- you're not flaring as much when you're having your period, but anatomically, you're creating a worse environment for your bladder wall. Okay. How, and when did how you're so you're 43 now? When did your symptoms start? Uh, it started when I was 37, 36, okay. 37, and I started the birth control at 40. Okay. And so, do you associate the onset of your symptoms at 37 with any event? Okay. Um, I had, uh, the gastric sleeve bypass. Okay. Um, not a, not a bypass the gastric sleeve where they remove a portion of your stomach. Okay. I had that done, um, four, three, four years before that. Okay. I don't know why, but for some reason I feel like I can't find it in any support groups, but I, I feel like maybe that might play a role because of everything I heard about gut health. And here they are removing a portion of my gut. Well, I don't, I, 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 and I don't know. Uh, I, I don't know. I, I think that, that your diet ends up being very restricted. Um, and, and I don't know, that's just not my area of expertise. I would be looking more at, you know, the health of your pelvic floor muscles after major surgery, because surgery is traumatic to muscles and it triggers a pain response. It can trigger tight muscles, et cetera, et cetera. I don't know. The question about the biome is a very, very good question. I I just don't know. Um, But the birth control is an issue. And also too, how about your diet? What was your diet like back then? Were you drinking diet soda, stuff like that? No. Um, I actually, I'm actually a pretty healthy eater. I always, I, I was for a good 20 years, um, always eating, um, you know, lower in carb, higher protein, higher fat. And, um, I had worked out incredibly a lot. Um, and then after I had my daughter, I just gained so much weight, but I was never a carb, a a carbonation drinker, an acid drinker. I didn't drink coffee. So I got to take that back, um, before I see. Um, and then after I had the weight loss surgery, I lost some weight. This actually, I went, started going back to the gym and I went back to the gym as if I was 20 years old. Yeah. Well, we all do that. That's a mistake. (laughs) And, um, within, I was also going through some financial issues, um, with my house at the time. And that was the week that I thought I had my, a UTI and that never went away. So it was me starting a major workout routine that I haven't done for about 15 years and having extreme amount of stress from thinking I was going to lose my house. And that is when my IC totally began. Okay. So if I could relate it to a specific time in my life, that was the time. Okay. So we would be looking again, you heard me talk earlier about the chicken versus the egg, which comes first, the chicken or the egg. And for us, it's which comes first, the bladder, the pelvic floor. They're they're both involved, but one is normally triggering the other. And that's what we're trying to figure out is what is triggering the other. It doesn't sound like you had a direct bladder wall issue. um, And yet your Elmeron suggests that your bladder wall is very, very involved. But have you had a pelvic floor assessment? Um, I had one and it wasn't... I wound up going to, I, I had like a knee injury. So I wound up going to the specialist for my knee. And during conversation, she mentioned how I told her about my IC. And she told me that she used to be work for a women's female pelvic place in um, New York. And that she would love to take me on as a case. I would just need to order this. It was like a device, that transvaginal device. No, no, um, yeah, no, 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 no. I'm just talking about the assessment. I mean, a finger, yeah. a finger in your vagina touching your muscles. Did anybody do that? Um, 
Yeah, all all of the urologists I've ever I've been to, no, and no, my no, gynecologist, no. and they've never mentioned anything. No, 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 no. But you haven't been to a pelvic floor physical therapist. I have not. Okay, when you go to pee, can you start your can you start your urine right away, or do you hesitate five, ten, fifteen, twenty seconds before you can relax enough to release your urine? Can't. Sometimes I could, and sometimes I can't. Okay. It's, it's not consistent. Okay, so why don't you ask for a referral? I mean, if it's not consistent, if you're not peeing like a horse every every time, then you've got tight muscles at some point in time. Okay. You know, and so that's kind of the missing piece is, is until we understand what the driving force is, doing something like Interstim, it, 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 it's a little early to do that. In, in the okay. ADA guidelines, pelvic floor physical therapy is step two. Interstim is step four. Okay. So you have, and you, you know, there's this odd thing I do, and I never really noticed it, but I know I, I clenched my butt and my thigh muscles, and I noticed it once when I was um, finally I went for a massage, and I I was so pleased to get a massage because it's been years, and I couldn't lay on my stomach long enough to not have bladder pain to get the massage. And finally I was feeling better. I got my massage and she was like, oh, your muscles are really tight as she's massaging my thighs. And I thought about it. And as I thought about it, I'm like, okay, let me like relax. And then I relax them. And I'm like, oh my goodness, am I like this all the time? And then five seconds later, I'm squeezing again. I think my natural state is to constantly squeeze and I don't know what it's well, like to Well, I think I, it's not a natural state. Usually there's some other, something other dysfunction that's forcing that like a bad knee. If you have a bad knee and you're not walking normally, your pelvic floor muscles are going to be directly affected by that. Okay. Okay. And so, you know, to me, the most, the more important question to be asking is what is the underlying anatomical dysfunction here? And we don't know. Is it, do, I would want a gynecologist to look at your skin and let's see how dry your skin is down there. If your skin looks healthy and your vagina looks healthy, then maybe estrogen is not the problem. But if your skin is dry, then estrogen could be the problem. And that, okay. Okay. so that's concept number one. At the same time, I would want the uro, the, the uh, urogynecologist or the gynecologist to do a very quick pelvic exam. Make sure you tell them that there are moments when you can pee and moments when you can't ask for a referral. And, and listen, doing the internal device is not ideal. What's ideal is a finger in your vagina touching muscles. That's okay. the proper therapy. And let me show you. I can show this to you. Um, okay, so let's look at this for a moment. So I understand your frustration and I understand why you're doing considering this and that and this and that. And the only yeah. the only way to make a good logical decision here is to go, step right back to the basics and let's look at the anatomy first. So look, so here's the pelvis, right? Yeah. And if we look inside, here are your pelvic floor muscles. And these are your deep muscles, right? And then we also have shallow muscles called the levator ani, which is a collection of muscles. There are several, several muscles here. So here are your, your, outer, your outer muscles. But we're going to take these off for a moment. Okay. So a pelvic floor examination involves a finger in your vagina touching muscle groups, right? Mm -hmm. And this is the best way to localize which muscle group is the dysfunctional group. And then from a therapeutic standpoint, the one thing I want you to see here is, is you can see that the muscles are flat along the bone. I don't know if you can see that, but you can see. Yeah, I can so, see that. So when the muscles get tight, they lift up and they start intruding in on the other, the other structures, the, the blood vessels, the nerves, the bladder, et cetera, et cetera. So therapeutically, it's still a finger in there stroking these muscles, trying to get these muscles to relax and flatten again. And so getting my first pelvic floor physical therapist did the same thing. She, we ordered the device. We got the device. Complete waste for me. 
Yeah. For me, it was about getting getting this muscle to flatten down and then teaching me how to do it at home with a glass wand, which is what I do. And so here's here's a glass wand, typical glass wand that we do. And you can see here, so now I have my glass wand in there and it can reach really high. Jill, why why when um I go for my um yearly pap smears and when they ask, oh, how you feel, and then I tell them, um, why aren't they chucking my pelvic floor muscles? Because doctors stay in their sandbox. Doctors stay in their sandbox. Gynecologists stay in the reproductive tract. Urologists stay in the urinary tract. They don't necessarily consider muscles. You, it's, okay. a, it's a very specific discussion. It's like, okay, doc, listen, I can't release my urine easily. There are times when I can and other times when I can't. Can you help me understand why? And the immediate logical assumption is tight muscles. Can you please, and sometimes you just have to ask, can you please do that? By the way, I want to get back here, just, if you don't mind, to Roger for a moment. So sure. we've been working with Roger on YouTube and we were just talking about hips. And he says, he says, I have avascular necrosis in both of my hips. Okay. So that's why you have tight muscles is because your hips are not functioning uh, normally. So you, Roger, you just proved that tes testicle pain hip issue just with that. So Roger, we can, I would, um, Roger, if you'd like to talk after this meeting, um, or call me this week, I'd be happy to talk with you a little bit more. Okay. All right. Okay, so so Lauren, again, to make the best decision, we have to understand your anatomy. You have to understand your anatomy more. So I want to know okay. what the quality and health of your skin is. I want to know what the quality and health of your muscles are. Right? Okay. That's fundamental. Now, but again, the Elmeron helped you. Yeah, and you know the strangest thing is when I started Elmeron, um, I'm, I'm one of those people that it took closer to a year, a year and a half to work. But when I started to feel a little better, when I urinated, it felt like a different type of urination stream. Like it was something I never thought about before I see, but now with the Elmeron, it's almost like I could feel that there's um, a fake coating that the urine comes out of. I know it sounds ridiculous, but the pee is not the same feeling I had before I had IC. Yeah. Even when it's a good stream. I know, but, but. For Elmeron to work a year and a half later, that's that's a little absurd. Elmeron is a very, very small molecule. It takes time for the molecule to build up to create a coating, but the, I've never heard of longer than a year. Uh, it's six months. Um, and so, so I would have to wonder if something else changed again, like birth control, you know, I don't uh, I, did the quality and health of your skin change in some way? Did you change birth control? Did you go off one thing, go on another thing that would have also potentially affected your bladder wall? But okay. if you want that same coating effect, then you want to do a chondroitin based supplement. Uh, we okay. had a research study presented last year at the European Society for the Study of IC, which found the chondroitin was the most effective at restoring the superficial integrity of the bladder wall. And okay. so if you wanted to follow that line, you could go for a chondroitin-based supplement or a chondroitin-based installation. But but I, I did get the aloe vera and the bladder builder uh -huh. and um, the bladder rest, which I was going to start after my installations and get off the Elmeron. Yeah. Um, I do have a shellfish allergy, which also very strangely happened a year before I got IC because um, I never had a shellfish allergy before. So it was very hard to find a conjointment, but I think the, I, the bladder builder or whichever one contains it is a shellfish free one. Uh, yeah, the, the bladder in the bladder builder, the chondroitin comes from chicken. Okay, good. Um, I don't believe. Yeah, there's no shellfish in, in there's no shellfish in bladder builder at all, and there's no shellfish in uh a bladder rest either. 
Okay. So, you know, pick one and just try it, but, you know, try it for six weeks or so and see how you do, but don't take a full dose the first day, you know, just take one capsule, see how you do, take it with food, see how you do and go there. But I guess to kind of wrap this up here, I understand your frenzy. I understand the, the confusion. Uh, But you can't let the confusion drive you into doing riskier therapies. Inner stem is a risky therapy. That's why it's in step four. Okay. And it used to be in step five. There are thousands of adverse event reports filed with inner stem, including fatalities. There were 20 patients died and that death was believed to be related to inner stem. Oh my goodness. So I haven't heard one positive thing. I've heard positive things, but not one person has reported on the support group that they did not have to go back and get it fixed because it moved. Not one person. Well, they, they, they move, patients get shocked, they break, but the most common adverse event for inner stem is a deep tissue MRSA infection. And so if you come on over to our website and go into our forum, we've got four message boards dedicated to neuromodulation, considering it, trying it, success stories and failures. It's important to look at the failures so that you have your eyes wide open. Interstim, there are a couple of points about Interstim that are really important. Number one is cost. Um, I've told this story before. It's very, very important that you get written confirmation from your insurance company that it is covered by your insurance. We had a nurse who had it done and she did what she thought was her due diligence. She talked to the doctor's office. They said it was covered, no pre-authorization required. She called the hospital. They said it was covered, no written pre-authorization required. She even called her insurance company and they said over the phone, yes, it's covered. And because they all said it was covered, she had it done. A week later, she had a bill for $80,000 and a threat to garnish her wages because she had the procedure done at at the hospital she worked at. So number one, make sure it's covered by your insurance and get it in writing from the insurance company. Number two, um, um. You have to have a real clear, calm discussion with your doctor about about risk versus benefits and adverse events. And you have to ask the doctor, what are the most common adverse events you have in your clinic? And if he says none, that's ridiculous because there are thousands that have been filed. Um, One of the things that we've seen in the past is a patient, you have the trial for two weeks. Trial's great. You're on board. It's like, all right, let's do it. I feel better on the trial. And then you have the implant. And we had one patient who, as as soon as she woke up from anesthesia, she knew there was a problem. And she said, guys, it doesn't feel the same. There's a problem. And they said, oh, it's just post-op recovery, yada, yada, yada. This went on for months. And she kept saying, there's a problem. It hurts. Help me. And they kept saying they were reprogramming the device, all this sort of stuff. When they finally removed it, her belly was filled with rusty battery fluid. (gasps) They did not. I wouldn't even want something that has battery fluid in my body. Well, they didn't listen to her. And she ended up with gangrene and a nerve injury from this. And that's kind of one of the challenges that we have is that in that in that recovery period, when you, the patient feels an issue and you say there's an issue, the doc and the med rep are going to go, well, we'll just reprogram it. And, and so there's this kind of divide in terms of making sure that they listen to you. It's like, I, there is a problem. Help me. And if they just say, well, reprogram, 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 it's like, no, that's not fixing it. There's a problem. Help me. And then last but not least, um, and as an example, I, I had a patient who every time she had a bowel movement, she got shocked. An IC patient called me and she called me, said, is it normal to get shocked when you have bowel movements? I'm like, no, absolutely not. And her doctor said, yes. And it's like, no. And I got her on the phone with Medtronic uh, customer care and they went, absolutely not. That is a serious problem, right? 
inner yeah. stem requires constant maintenance. And if you lose your health insurance, that's the third question you're going to ask the doctor. If I lose my health insurance, will you still be my doctor? And if they say no, then you're going to say, well, then who's going to care for this device, which requires continent, constant maintenance? And if they say, I don't know, then you're going to say, well, then I don't want to get this done, potentially. Yeah. And we, that actually doesn't sound like something I'd want to get done unless I don't feel I'm there. We have be, you. Yeah. You haven't even done all of step one or step two yet. Yeah. There's no I'm just reason like, for you to go to step four yet. Yeah. None at all. Okay. And then that's from the American Urology Association. That's not from me. That's from the AUA. So okay. let's just take a step back, take a breath and focus on anatomy first. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Huh? Nice talking with you. Thank you so much. I wish you well. All right, Michelle. Thank you. Michelle, are you there? I tried to talk to Michelle. Michelle, you have to unmute your mic. There you are. Hello. Hey, Michelle, how are you doing today? Well, I'm in a mess. <laughs> okay, what's going on? Tell me. Well, for I had to stop pelvic floor therapy because it was, it was just too painful. Okay. They had done some Botox and switched meds around and you know, I was on flexural and all that business. Well, it just got worse. Okay. Well, I've, I think I've been in bed since July. And now my white count is 16. And it's been that way since December. My question is, I finally got the microgenics um, and I sent that in. It came back high bacterial load. Of course, you know, three cultures comes back negative. Nothing grows, but then that goes. Well, he wasn't very excited about it. He didn't understand it. And from what I understand, when you y'all were talking about it, it was people, I remember somebody saying they were on it for six months in antibiotic. And that's where I'm confused, where he won't send in another microgenics. I did two weeks of antibiotics. My labs are actually worse than they were before. So I don't know what to do. And, and is that a thing that you have to be on antibiotics that long? I don't know. I'm, I'm just well, confused what, about the microgenics. So, so microgen testing is data. It's just data. That's what I told him. And it just, it <laughs> just said, helps us understand what and if anything is going on in your in your in your urine and in your urinary tract so you were negative for fungus well i mean they did a culture i don't know what they did i mean i'm not in charge of the lab. well ne a next generation test is not a culture no i mean the culture through the hospital that came back negative for what and then i for anything it well grow okay, anything. okay but no but no 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 hun a culture so a culture means that they have do you know what a petri dish is yeah i understand what a culture okay, is they so, put it on the dish and let it grow okay but days. it's dependent on the growth medium right so but i can't so, i can't change what how the hospital runs their business. okay but but what was the what was the culture trying to grow out bacteria fungus or virus what do we know i, I don't know you don't know okay do they never tell you that Okay, so so because and and what were the results of that culture? Zero, they didn't find anything. No, ma'am. And did they give you a written form that talked about the culture results? No. Okay. But I mean, as a practitioner myself, I've done cultures and I've never put on the order form, okay, test for fungus, test for this. And I've seen many, many cultures come back and I've never seen it say, okay, we only tested for this or that. So well, you're yeah, but talking about a specialty lab. Well, no, 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 no. You're you're just you're just not understanding. It, different bacteria eat different things. And yeah, so, I so, what so you're saying. you're limited based upon the culture medium, and that's what they say. They say that a typical urine culture is going to miss almost ninety percent of the potential things that could grow out in your urine. And that is why the next generation test is another step in that information gathering, because that will at least reveal through DNA, if you have fungus in your urine, 
or if you have okay. good bacteria well, in your is, urine. Or, okay, do you have the page of test results? I do, but I don't have it in front of me just now. Okay, but so so it, it was it wasn't any fungi, it was all bacteria. Okay, so what were the bacteria? Oh, there was there was a pile of okay, it. Okay, can you go get it? That's important. Well, it was positive. I mean, it, you're it you're right. that everything was sensitive to macrodantin. Okay, but wait, 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 wait. Urine is not sterile. You're we know that the u urinary tract has a thriving bi um uh, bio um biome. <laughs> Sorry, I was thinking biome versus virome. So we know that there are some bacteria that are supposed to be in there, and that's where it gets very complex in interpreting next generation results because we're still they're still gathering information on what a normal urinary biome is. There can be good beneficial bacteria in there as well as pathogenic bacteria in there. And so did they find, as an example, urea plasma? I'll have to go look. Or what would that show? Microplasma. Or E. coli. What did they, I mean. I know E. coli was on there. Okay. So. I'll have to go find it and get that. Too. Yeah, you, you got to find it because we're not going to be worried about the lactobacillus because that's probably going to be normal flora. What we, what we want to look at is the potential pathogenic strain. So that's going to be the E. coli, the enterococcus, potentially, although that's debatable, uh, the ureoplasma, the microplasma, et cetera, et cetera. Um, okay, and if let's say it, let's say it's positive for that, what does that mean? Well, then then, that? then it depends upon how much is in there. It depends upon how much is in there. If you're ninety percent E. coli, then then we definitely have an E. coli abnormality going on. But if it's only two percent E. coli, then we're probably not going to worry about it that much. I guess I'm confused because when I got the report back from the the lab and the doctor shared it with me, we were talking about it. Well, he said he was only going to do a normal course of antibiotics. Okay. Now, I said, well, why don't we do it longer if we're, look, if we're, if we're dealing with biofilms and all that? So he agreed for two weeks. Well... It, I felt better for two days and then it, it just went back. It, you know what I mean? I felt like I was getting better. I just wanted to know the length of time that it would take to. Well, that, that's where, that's where you get into a lot of debate and controversy. Right. And the, the lab didn't help. I'm like, don't you help the doctor decide like how to do this? No, we don't. We're not the doctor. But I'm like, but he doesn't know. So well, how do we, how do you find somebody that's actually willing to send you to there and then actually know what they're looking you at? Would, you would want it if it if it is a long term chronic infection that is just not responding to any therapy, then we want to go to an infectious disease specialist. OK, well, that's on the books already, you know. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, nothing's nothing's perfect. None, none of these tests are foolproof. You can have false positives or false negatives with a urine culture. And again, based upon how the next generation test is interpreted, some could say it's an infection or it's not, or it's just a, it's just normal flora. And you're stuck in the middle. You don't know how to interpret it. But what the doctor has to do is the doctor is going to follow normal antibiotic protocols because what we know is antibiotics that are used for a long period of time are going to create risk of drug resistancy. And exactly. so there we have an antibiotic stewardship program. And the purpose of our antibiotic stewardship program is to make sure that we're not overusing antibiotics. What is the, what's the stewardship program? Well, every, every hospital has their own stewardship program. This is all about what can we do to, present the, to prevent the development of drug-resistant inf infections. Everybody admits that antibiotics 20 years ago were handed out like candy. And the problem with that is the more antibiotics in the body, uh, the, more anti the, the more the likelihood that the E. coli is going to adapt and develop a resistancy, that the it learns how to defeat the antibiotic. And E. coli is very, is very stealthy. E. coli will change shapes 
Uh, if it did, if it detects a threat, it will change its shape so that a white blood cell doesn't recognize it. It also commits bacterial harikari where it creates little tiny passive seeds of DNA, of RNA that just sit there silently for a while and then they get turned on. And so E. coli infections are challenging, rough infections. And it might surprise you to learn that a lot of the E. coli infections that we're seeing are not coming from bad, uh, you know, women are kind of blamed with hygiene. They say you're not wiping correctly. You need to wipe from front to back, et cetera. Where actually a lot of the drug resistant E. coli infections are coming from our food. If you remember the, mm -hmm. the Costco chicken debacle, the, uh, the, where people got very, very ill. And I think some died from eating Costco chicken that was undercooked. And that was from a drug resistant E. coli. E. coli, these E. coli infections uh, develop in animal feed facilities. But well, um, wouldn't you be positive for like E. coli in other places? You know, if I ingest it, wouldn't you find it other places? Well, if, if you ingest it, it's going to be in your gut and it's going to be on your skin and it's going to, and it's, it's, it has the potential of causing bladder infections. We had a very famous case of a bunch of college students in Idaho, Washington, and Oregon who got this really rare drug resistant E. coli and they traced it back to a slaughterhouse in Idaho that was selling beef to um, um, the commons, to the universities. So, so, so don't, how can you, how can you know that, uh, how, what kind of lab would do that? Well, how but, but that? It, that doesn't matter. Uh, the point that I'm trying, what I'm trying to say here is that I don't want you to believe that, you, that you, this is your fault. And I don't want you to carry the shame of people saying that you're causing yourself because you have poor hygiene. Understand that a lot of the really drug resistant infections are coming from food, specifically meat, specifically meat from big, large factory farms where they have to use a lot of antibiotics to prevent diseases. And so some of the worst E. coli infections are coming from pork. And we have a super infection that started in China and that is now in the US and it caused bladder infection. It's about five years ago, it caused a bladder infection and somebody in a woman with no history of traveling. And when they identified this really rare, but very virulent E. coli, they actually found it in some pork farms on the East Coast. So these drug resistant infections are out there. And that's why it's very, very important that number one, we cook our meat very, very well to kill, kill bacteria and better yet pick better sources of meat, maybe locally sourced meat from local farms as compared to meat that's produced in a factory farm setting. And so, you know, your case is complex. You've been bed bound for months. And we can't put all of our apples in one basket. We have two distinct issues that are going on. Number one, you may have an infection, and let's have the, the infectious disease doctor check that out. But the other far more logical thing is you clearly also have a pelvic floor problem because when they tried to work with your muscles, it hurt. Yes, it hurts a lot. <laughs> okay, and so so we have uh, another another lady in our in our Facebook groups who joins our chats fairly regularly, and she was the same way. She's like her muscles were tight. There were no doubt they were tight, but damn it, the physical therapy really hurt her every single time. And for me, when I started physical therapy, they, they'd only hurt a couple of times and then things relaxed. For her, they never relaxed. For you, they never relaxed. Why? Why? And you have to get this book. You can, well, it's you free. Afraid, you can't read anything. It, it's free it's on Kindle. Well, okay. It's free on Kindle Unlimited. Like I'm not making a profit. It's free on Kindle Unlimited. He talks about this. He talks about the, that small group of patients who, whose muscles are always tight. You can go have physical therapy. You can relax the muscles for an hour and then bam, the tension is back. The trigger points are back. Why? And what he's, oh, you have to just walk to the car and then it's over. 
like, why bother? Okay, but, okay, but we have to understand the mechanics of that. That's not normal. There is something abnormal happening in your pelvis. And there is something that is making your muscles tight. We have to figure that out. And just like Roger on, on YouTube, for him, it's his hips. He has a problem with his hips. And, and so I think it would be really meaningful for you to, since pelvic floor therapy was so painful, to talk with the pelvic floor physical therapist. Call her on the phone and say, did you see any abnormalities with my bones down there? Is my tailbone out of position? Have you ever had a tailbone injury? Um, no. Okay. Have you I, ever fallen? I mean, no, we, have you she, ever fallen? She addressed all that. Well, yes, I have. Okay. So, so. But that's not going to make my white count go to 16 plus. You I, know? I know, but if you ignore it, and that's also part of the problem, you're not going to get better. You've got two fundamental things to figure out here. This, why the hell are my muscles so tight? And number two, what the hell is going on with my urine? So with Sue, who comes into our meetings, you, she finally had a CAT scan. They did a CAT scan. And you know what they found? She had a, um, a massive growth inside, a, a growth of scar tissue inside her left piriformis muscles. And How much fun on the CAT scan? It was either a CAT scan or an MRI. And you're okay. kind of at that point. You're kind of at that point. Every time they well, I got, I had all that. I didn't have an MRI, but I had a CAT scan and an ultrasound, and you know, full GI workup, the whole thing. And well, but we're not. And, well, it's just confusing. You try to, you know, just check boxes. But it, it always begins with your anatomy here. It always begins with your anatomy. Pelvic floor physical therapy hurts. That's not normal. It should not hurt. We have to figure out why it hurts. What have we missed? What have they missed? Do you walk normally? Do you have a bad foot? Do you have a bad knee? Do you have a bad hip? Or like me, do you have a bad SI joint? I have a bad okay. SI joint. And, okay. And once we well, once we figured out that my SI joint was making my muscles so tight, it completely changed how we were working with stuff. So don't go down the microgen rabbit hole here and focus all of your efforts on that. That's one little piece of your mystery. But the other far bigger piece of your mystery is what the hell is wrong with your muscles that you're in so much pain when they touch them? Do you have endometriosis? Could you have a fibroid tumor? Or again, is it, is it something as simple as, is your tailbone crooked? You'd be stunned by the number of patients who have tailbone injuries. Their tailbone oh. has healed out of position. It's straight rather than curved, or it's off to the left or off to the right. Does that make sense? Well, yes, but not really for my question. Well, you <laughs> Thank know, you. yeah, I know it, it. It's complicated. It's complicated, and um. You know, you're, you're just going down two holes. And so don't ignore one. You got to go down one door and you got to go down the other door at the same time. And so with Sue, they told her for 20 years she had IC. She put, they had her on every bladder therapy. Nothing worked. Now we know why nothing worked because fundamentally it was a big mass of scar tissue sitting on her pelvic floor that was driving all of her pain. Interesting. So, so, so well, give me a minute and let me get the paper. You can go back to some. Well, you know what? I'm going to have to. What I'd love to do is I'd love to talk with you on Tuesday or Wednesday um, because I'm going to have to wrap this meeting up soon. Okay. But if if you can if you can go get it quickly, fine. But just know I'm going to have to shut this down probably in the next five minutes. Okay. Yeah. Give me a minute. Okay. Roger said. <laughs> 2% lidocaine jelly was placed in the urethra, flexible 19 French, flexible cystoscope was inserted. I've had the AVN for five years, never caused that much pain, definitely not any pelvic pain. I think the cystoscopy may have just woken. Yeah, it could have woken up the nerves. It could have triggered the nerves. 
It does, uh, Roger. You're right. It doesn't. You sure? It doesn't sound like permanent damage. Uh, but nerves, when they get provoked, get very can be pretty hard to calm down. But are you having nerve pain? Nerve pain is electrical pain. It's pins and needles. Sciatica, pain shooting down your leg. Are you having anything like that? And you guys, you know, for those of you listening on Facebook and YouTube here, that's a, you know, this is a really hard discussion with Michelle. Um, next generation testing is hard to interpret. And like I say, it's data. It's data. That's all it is. And if it can help us understand that something is just funky in your biome, power to it. If everything looks normal, that's great. That's good data. That means we don't need to deal with UTI anymore. If you had an action test and it came back with nothing, then you can walk away from the theory that you have a UTI. And it would be time to focus your money on things outside of your of your bladder that could be triggering some of your symptoms. But if the next generation test did show something ab abnormal, then it's reasonable to have a discussion about, you know, what could that be? Could you have a, a, a one of those very difficult to uh, diagnose urea plasma or mycoplasma infections? Or, or again, could you have one of these super drug resistant E. coli infections? But hi, Andrea, it's it's, you cannot have a discussion about viable treatments until you understand your anatomy. And with Michelle, we do not understand her anatomy. This is what we know. Her muscles are tight. And when she does pelvic floor physical therapy, it hurts. That's what we know. The second thing we know is that the next gen test showed something. That's are the you there? Yeah, I'm here. That's the only data we have. It says... Klebsiella, E. coli, and Enterococcus. Okay. So Klebsiella. Hi. Oh, um, thank you, Andrea. Uh, so Klebsiella is a pathogenic infection. E. coli is potentially a pathogenic infection. Does it get percentages? It just gives you a high greater than okay. 10 to the seventh. Okay. Okay. And and from an antibiotic standpoint, what did they, it what did it recommend? Um, they just said, they didn't, they just give you, um, the resistant genes detected. They don't, Okay. What but all of these are not for Denton, So that's what he gave me. Okay. So wait a second. Are you saying the test came back that they were macrodantin resistant? What were they resistant to? What were your resistance genes? Methicillin, beta-lactam, and macrolide. Wow. Isn't that interesting? I don't know what that means. Okay, so you I'm not a urologist. You, well, and even a ur urologist might have a challenge with that. I think talking with an infectious disease specialist is going to be very interesting. I think so. So I um, was hoping that. Well, I mean, I'm glad I asked the question because I, I don't under I didn't understand the place. You know. Yeah. Like I, I have, I have a, uh, an amylase drug resistance gene every time I've been tested. And I have no history of ever taking that type of antibiotic that I can remember. And yet mm -hmm. I, ca I carry that, the bacteria in my urinary tract carry that drug resistance gene. The only way that could have happened is if I got it from food or if they injected me with that when I was out having surgery. Right, but they're just saying that there's, they're not saying that these bacteria are indeed resistant. They're just saying that they detected some well, in but there. I guess it didn't grow. Well, but that's what that means. That's right. what that means. That's why next generation testing is so important because it identifies drug resistant genes so that you don't waste time using those, those medicines to try to treat the infection because you have the, you have the resistant genes in there. I guess so. you, you get it. I do get it. Yeah, but it's not. I guess I'm not asking it properly. Then I'm not saying it right. Yeah. So the the, the, the real question is is then what antibiotic should you take? And normally attached to the report is a list of antibiotics that that can kill it. Did you get that part of the report? Well, you know, it's a fax copy, so it's not it's not very clear. Okay. All that little writing. 
So, so that's what you need is you need the second half of that data. We know what the drug resistant genes are, but what we don't know are what are the antibiotics that could kill it. And so you want to get a clear picture of that report and bring it with you when you talk with the infectious disease specialist. So you're, you're, you're guessing. You're, you're well, I'm not the doctor. I'm not supposed to have to do this. I know, but that's what but his job. I well, yeah, but you are an equal participant in your care. You you pay I him. Guess, you pay him. He doesn't pay you. So you have right, to walk for in. Me knowledge. To do all the research to follow yep. up on him. It's like, well, then why don't I go to medical school and not diagnose myself? Well, but understand that when he went through medical school, they were all taught that urine was sterile. Right. A lot of this is new. The whole human biome thing is new. And the urinary biome, we've only been these, they've been doing these studies for the last five or 10 years. He doesn't know, just like you don't know. He's a human too. That why if you bring information in and you help educate, you know, I have a policy with my with my doctors. I bring gifts every single time. And my gifts are usually meaningful articles. Um, and say, okay, because they don't have time to read all the journals, they barely have time to to update their patient records. Now, if you can bring in something supportive that says, look, I got Klebsiella, I got this, I've got drug resistance genes here. I, do, I don't know if this is normal or not. I don't believe that this is normal. I would like your opinion on this. And here are a couple of articles I found that might help us study this further together. You are an equal participant in your care. Are those articles on your website? They are, on, they are, some of them are on our website, and then we have links to the National Library of Medicine where you can get the others. And if you want to call me, I would be happy to, we can do, do our search together online and I can send you some links that might be helpful for your doctor. But, but you know, doctors right now are between COVID and, and just trying to be normal. They are, they are stressed like they've never been stressed before. And we can't. We have to do as much as we as much as we can to to make this as informative for them as we can. They they just don't have the time in ten minutes to go down the rabbit hole of all these, and it is a rabbit hole. Yes, it is. And I'm not I'm not saying next generation urine testing is the greatest thing in the world. I am saying that it's just data. It's data. That's all it is. And it is up to, to your medical care providers to try to interpret that data. And the most value with the next generation test, in my opinion, is the identification of candida and fungus. It's easy to interpret that. It's much harder to interpret the bacterial results. But if you positive Klebsiella and you're positive E. coli and you're up at, and they described it as as heavy, what they, what they describe, high? They just give you a level, high, high. greater than high, then, then, whatever that means. Yeah, then to me, it sounds like, you know, a consult with a next-gen specialist to interpret that data and to get some therapy would be perfectly reasonable. But again, you got two separate things going on. I do. So you got you to gotta pursue both of them at the same time. Well, that's difficult. But. Well, you know, thank yeah, you for your help. <laughs> but but you're a tough cookie. You've gotten this far. You've never been more prepared to deal with whatever happens to you than you are at this very moment, because you are truly one day older and one day wiser. You know, and and so don't doubt don't doubt yourself. It's just we've got some patience here. It's, it's hard to be in pain and to be an advocate when you feel like crap, and you certainly feel like crap right now because you've been in bed for some time. The question is, what's keeping you in bed? And we just don't know. It sounds like well, your, it sounds like your muscles are a big, big part of this problem. Well, to me, it sounds like sepsis, but well, yeah. I mean, <laughs> if if you think you've got sepsis, then you should. I would go to urgent care. Well, and they need to do well, some blood tests because sepsis could be fatal. If you truly no, believe, no. if you believe you have sepsis, as soon as we're done, you need to go to urgent care and have them checked. Because you'll never figure this out on your own. Right? Well, yes, ma'am. Thank because, you. Yeah. All right, hon. Well, listen, Michelle, big giant hug to you. I know that you're confused. I know that you're frustrated. And I truly hope that somebody can find an answer for you. 
And if you want to, if you want to talk to me and I can help you try to find some articles and maybe put some questions together for you, doctor, I would be happy to do that this week for you. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Okay. My email, I see network at Mac.com. And in the meantime, if you can, this book is free on Kindle Unlimited. Go get it and think about your pain and think about what they were touching with physical therapy so that we can try to isolate what was hurting when they were touching it. Okay. 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 Yes. Oh, all right. Hun. Big giant hug. All right, guys. Listen, I'm going to shut down the Zoom portion of the meeting. Oh, can I ask you one more question before you go? Yes. This chondroitin, where are you getting it from? Uh, the chondroitin and bladder builder and bladder rest comes from chicken. No, I mean, is it called bladder rest or bladder? Bladder builder is, is one supplement. Bladder rest is the other supplement. Sister Protec is another supplement where it comes from chicken. Uh, at least the last time they told me it came, it came from chicken. And this art, is art on Amazon? Uh, uh, they're through our website. Um, their sister project right now has a manufacturer's delay. It's not available. Bladder rest. You should be able to get on Amazon and you can get them from our store and you can get them from okay. the manufacturer. Okay. Thank you. Yes. All right. Big giant hug to you. I wish you well. Thank you. You bet. Right back at you. Okay. All right. So, you know, that was such an important phone call um, or Zoom meeting that, I mean, that's because those are the kind of phone calls that I get almost every day, you know, and <sighs> pelvic pain is complex, guys. I see it's complex. It's complex. Not everybody's the same. Every patient is an, is an anatomical mystery to be solved. And until you understand the anatomy, it's damn hard to talk about therapy. And so her case is like the perfect way for you to see that number one, not everybody's the same. Everybody has different presentations. And number two, sometimes there are multiple things going on. Like let's say she had two scenarios. Let's say that she had an infection, but her pelvic floor was completely normal. Then she would have had frequency, urgency, pressure, pain. They would have found the infection, treated it immediately, right? But here's what we know. She has muscles, so something so messed up in her pelvis that when they touch the muscles, it hurts like hell. So there's clearly an issue there. And now she also apparently does have maybe a pathogenic infection. And sometimes as Dr. as Dr. Weiss talks about in this book, it's like peeling an onion. You got layer after layer after layer after layer we peel away. Hormones, injury, um, other conditions, infection. And it's just you it's hard to be patient as you're going through this, but you can't put all your eggs in one basket. Does that make sense? I hope that that makes sense. Kim says, hey, Jill, have you tried Voltaire and gel on your neck? I have not. She says, I've had IC since 2005, have increased back and flank pain and urinated all the way in my clothes. Had had past a kidney stone, renal with normal, ultrasound with normal, except for urethral, urethral jets were not visualized, Urin urinary urology, PA saw me and saw where my bladder was not emptying, even after voiding three times. Next, she recommended your dynamics. So a urodynamics basically tests the nerve function in your bladder. Your case is your case is funky. Uh, you're not emptying your bladder, and so we would want to know why. Do you have a prolapse, or is it a problem with your nerves? So your dynamics in that context makes total sense. Incidentally, you had 102 fever during the week of spinal flank pain, groin pain, losing my urine, but also had a COVID vaccine that morning. Uh, 
I, you know, I listen, it's data. Again, it's about data. A urodynamics is not required for a diagnosis of IC, but a urodynamics can be done if a doctor is looking for more data. They're looking to try to understand how your nervous system is functioning. And so I think it would be perfectly reasonable for a doctor to suggest a urodynamics for you at this point in time. I've had it done. Basically, they just fill your, you know, you're laying on your back. You've got, you've got a catheter in you uh, with some equipment. And uh, what they do is they slowly fill your bladder. And then they say, tell us when you first feel the need to, when you first feel fullness. And then you go, you go now. And then they go, tell us when you first feel discomfort. You go now. And they go, okay, tell us when you first feel this. You go, okay, now. And they might push it a little bit past that. And then that's done. And it basically tests you you know, kind of what we call your waking bladder capacity as well as basic nerve function. So, you know, um, Sleepy says, are we able to deliver to the United Kingdom yet? No, not yet. Denise says, why do I get yeast every time I take antibiotics? Because the antibiotics are killing the bacteria that normally control the yeast. That's the problem with taking antibiotics is it's like taking a, a flamethrower to a, uh, you know, a tropical forest. It kills everything, including the good bacteria that keep your bad bacteria in check. I mean, your bad bacteria and your candida in check. Roger says, is it possible for a cystoscopy to go, still cause damage even without bleeding and burning symptoms? Like I said, three months in, I don't, hun, I just can't, I can't visualize it. I can't visualize what it would do. The only thing it would do is stretch your urethra and trigger pain. But you're not having pain in your urethra. You're having pain up by your belly button, which is above your bladder. So to me, it sounds like the procedure was so painful, it just triggered massive pelvic floor tension. Um, I mean, because you're not even describing bladder spasms um, so much. Andrea, thank you for praying for Michelle. I appreciate that. Becky says, does anybody use oral uh, birth control pills? Uh, does it help you feel better? Um, uh, it, you know, uh, I took it for three years, but then I had my, my uterine cancer thing. So, and I asked the doctor, I said, why, why would I get, you know, uterine cancer when my, nobody in my family has ever had a hormone driven uh, cancer and my mother took or oral hormones for 50 years. And his answer was, it's not genetic anymore. It's just, do you have the cells to get turned on by the estrogen? So understand that when you take oral, oral uh, estrogen products that you are um, uh, opening up a door, uh, a risk towards hormone driven cancers. Um, uh, whereas topical estrogen tends to stay in that tissue and is considered much safer. So you want to have a discussion with your doctor about the pros and cons of that, especially if anybody in your family has a history of estrogen driven cancers. <sighs> Becky says only took hormone replacement three and a half years after a complete hysterectomy, never felt good, had a DNC related to ongoing blood pressure. Yeah, so uh, so Becky had high blood pressure with her hormone. I mean, I asked the doctor, I mean, because hysterectomy is rough. I mean, you're four. If you want to know where all this wrinkles and stuff happened? It happened. It happened immediately after my hysterectomy four years ago. Immediately. It's like you age 10 years in a year. Um, and... Um, I had one doctor say, you should go back on oral estrogen. And my answer was, well, if I had it in my uterus, can I get it in my breasts? And I went and had a consult with a, another doctor who said, yeah, there's a group of women who, who you can get the cancer. If you've already had it one place, you can get it in the other place, which is why I'm not on it, which is why I'm now aging as quickly as I am. Ugh, getting old sucks. Um... Sharon says, my doctor wants to do nerve block in my pelvic floor for my pelvic floor muscles being so tight. I'm hoping this gives me some relief. Anyone gotten this done? It'll be interesting to see if it helps, hon. I've had two nerve blocks. Um, uh, and uh, they were done through the top of my vagina. And it was interesting. I mean, it was a 
wasn't the funnest thing in the world to do. It was a giant needle, but but uh, it ended up numbing. Uh, it missed the my pain location by about an inch, <laughs> which is funny. So I had a part of my butt that was numb, but not the part where I was feeling pain. Lisa said, is next generation testing covered by insurance? For some, yes. For some, no. It depends upon your insurance company and the doctor ordering it. She says, I have strange UTI yeast infections with Hunter's IC over the last decade. Really appreciate your help. And is this just another layer of being immune suppressed and chronically ill? You know, um, so um, there's absolutely a group of women who do get, uh, and men who do get recurring infections, recurring UTI. Um, and again, we're going to look at estrogen atrophy, but we also want to look to see if maybe you have an immune deficiency in some way. Um, that could also explain recurring, recurring infections. Andrea says, Dr. Peters said, hi, awesome. Uh, I'm not in the same pain that I was in when I was first diagnosed. I have frequency urgency. He wants me to try pelvic floor therapy and Botox. What do you know about Botox for IC? Girl, I have got a whole section of our website on Botox. Botox is in, in the step four treatment option. If you go over to icnetwork.org, you can do that. Uh, and if you're under the care of Dr. Peters, that's incredible. He's absolutely one of the best doctors in the country. Certainly one of the best surgeons in the country. He's known for being very, very meticulous. Um, the challenge of Botox can go in your bladder wall. Botox can go in, in muscles. Um, if it's put in your bladder wall, you're always going to run the risk of urinary retention because, you know, basically here's your bladder and they're just going to do random Botox in your bladder wall. And if they accidentally hit the nerve that controls your ability to pee, then you might have to self-catheterize for a period of time. You don't have that same risk if they're doing it in muscle. So it depends upon where they're doing it, hon. But, you know, um, the um, Be Beaumont Health is, in my opinion, the top IC research center in the nation with some of the best clinicians there. I refer patients there all the time. I think that you can understand that the reason why they're so good is that they're meticulous when it comes to a diagnostic workup. Becky says, I'm not talking about birth control. I mean, hormone replacement. I'm on the cream now. Yeah. Okay. Sandra said I had three pelvic surgeries and now getting a spinal stimulator. Which one are you getting, hon? Uh, Becky says my face is age. I know, right? Before the hysterectomy, people usually thought I was in my thirties. Now after the hysterectomy, they're going, yeah, she's an old bitch. <laughs> oh God. The stories we can tell. Amy says, is there any connection between IC, endometriosis, and rheumatoid arthritis, and also asthma? My daughter has all. Um, uh, certainly, certainly. IC and endometriosis are considered the evil twins. Uh, they are commonly found together uh, because endometriosis can attach to the bladder. And with the rheumatoid arthritis, definitely we've got some, you know, we've got an immune issue going on there, inflammatory issue going on there. And, um, uh, we have the chronic overlapping pain conditions. What would be very interesting would be, does she have IBS? Does she have vulvodynia? Does she have migraines? Does she have TMJ? If she does, Amy, that puts her into IC subtype 5, chronic overlapping pain conditions. And we know now in that case that that is a central nervous system disorder. Um, and I've got a whole uh, section on that. We now know that connection. And it goes back to brain scans, interestingly. Uh, both the IC researchers as well as the chronic pain researchers about 10 years ago started doing a lot of brain scans to see if our brains were different. And you know what? Our brains are different for those of us who have IC and IBS and fulvodynia. And they have now been able to determine that in our case, our sympathetic nervous system is not turning off like it should be turning off. It's staying on. So you've got uh, you've got the parasympathetic nervous system and the sympathetic nervous system. 
the normally your day-to-day -day operations are being managed by your parasympathetic nervous system. The sympathetic nervous system only turns on when you're under threat. So if you open up your front door and you see a tiger across the street, that is a threat. And your sympathetic nervous system takes command and control of your brain. And what it does is it raises your blood pressure, it raises your heart rate, it uh, um, uh, tightens your muscles, it changes how your body is processing sugar because it is preparing you to fight or flee for your life. But normally after the stressor is gone, the it turns off and the parasympathetic nervous system takes over and it calms everything down. It lowers your blood pressure, it lowers your heart rate, et cetera, et cetera. But what we are finding now, what they are finding now in the IC and to IBS and vulvodynia and the TMJ patient and, and the fibro patient and the migraine patient is that the sympathetic nervous system is stuck in the on position. And what that means then is that we are living under extended fight or flight. And it's characterized by really high levels of anxiety. I mean, we're talking a lot of catastrophic thinking that, you know, I'm dying. I'm going to get, you know, what else is going to happen? Nobody can help me. That high, high, high level of, of um, catastrophic thinking. Um, the good news now, now that we know this, we now know that this is called a central nervous system maladaption. It's not a mental illness. It's a maladaption. It means the nerves are not functioning correctly. So I attended a class, uh, well, a, a three-day conference from the International Public Pain Society last fall, and they went into this in depth. The most important part of that class was the risk factor class, the pediatric risk factors. What is it that makes some people get multiple pain conditions and others none? And the answer is in the pediatric risk factors, 80% of the kids had a physical trauma or injury in the year prior to the onset of the pain conditions, that there was a physical structural injury or trauma. It could have been falling on the tailbone, breaking the tailbone, could have been being hit by a car, et cetera. And that that has triggered a maladaption in the nerves. And that's part of it that I guess, I guess I understand, but I don't understand. I mean, I understand, I understand little bits of it, but not all of it. Um, one of the challenges that we have with children is that number one, they don't tell mom and dad when they're hurt and they often don't tell mom and dad, um, when they're struggling. Uh, so I want you to figure, think about that young boy He's riding his bicycle with his buddies and they jump over a pothole and he lands and crushes his, his testicles and his rectum and his pelvic floor and his perineum against the bar of the bike. Man, he has suffered a bam, hard compression injury. So much so he falls off the bike and he's laying in the fetal position, but he's blocks from home, right? And, he, and it takes him a few minutes to get up and his friends are around, but he eventually gets up and he's bending over. And then eventually he's like, are you, the kids are going, are you okay? Are you okay? And he, eventually he can get back on his bike and they go about their day. He might be sore, but he goes about his day. But is he going to tell mom and dad he did that? No. And, you know, but they might go, honey, you're not walking normally. Is everything okay? And he goes, oh, I kind of fell off my bike. but kids sometimes hide it. They just don't, they just don't want, especially a young boy, certainly going to not tell his mom and dad he, he peeing hurts. It's going to take time for that to develop to the point where he's finally going to admit that he needs a little bit of help. Cause you know, what's a burden that so many men carry is your, it's your, your job to fix it. And that's so sad. It puts such unreasonable burden on men. So theory number one is that this is an injury that just wasn't treated correctly and that there's been in pain for a long period of time and that pain has amped up the nervous system, the central nervous system. 
But the other group is also interesting because 20% of those patients were found to be the victim of abuse or bullying. And that's where it makes more sense when you think about the fight or flight system being stuck on. Imagine, imagine having a bully at school like I had. Remember, I had a guy at school who raped and murdered my neighbor. We all had in my class, we had to deal with a kid who was severely mentally ill. And, you know, he's he's a massive jail time now. And I was told he was dead, that he died in prison. Anyway, so imagine what happens to a child who faces a bully. As soon as they wake up in the morning, they fear going to school, right? It's like, oh God, I've got to go to school. I've got to go deal with this guy. And they put their clothes on and they eat their breakfast and you send them on their way and their nervous system is amped up. They're, they're looking, where's the bully? As soon as they walk out of the door, where's the bully? Oh my God, is he going to throw a rock at me? The closer they get to school, the more the anxiety happens. And this, so this child is hypervigilant from the time they wake up until the time they walk in your door every single day. And that's not normal. And that is what leads to extended long-term sympathetic nervous system maladaption is they never get to, they never get a break. The only break they have is when they walk in the door, but they know they're going to have to go to school the next day. And it, it never calms down. And so over time, their nervous system just gets stuck in massive stress and massive anxiety and massive fear. <clears throat> Imagine a puppy bringing home, that you bring home, happy puppy, waving tail, happy, 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 happy. Walks in the door, puppy, wagging his tail, running to everybody. And when your back is turned, somebody kicks it. And you hear the yelp. And you turn around, oh, are you okay, puppy? The puppy comes over, yeah, I'm okay. Wagging, 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 wagging. And then he gets kicked again when you're not looking. And then he gets kicked again. And he gets kicked multiple times by somebody in the family who's cruel. Well, that puppy is no longer wagging its tail. And two weeks later, that puppy is afraid to walk into every room. And he's looking for, he's looking for the stressor. That puppy is living under massive fight or flight. Massive fight or flight. So here's what we know based on the research, 20 days of stress like that would change the brain for the worst. It, we see in the brain scans, they see in the brain scans, brain behavior changing for the worst, 20 days of bullying, 20 days of anxiety, 20 days of stress. If you start a new job and you have a bully at work as an adult, this is happening to you too. This is happening to you. You're going into fight or flight every time you get in the car and you walk into work. If you feel out of control, I mean, you feel like you have no backup and you're stressed and you're scared, you're going into fight or flight. 20 days, that's all it takes for your brain to be changed for the worse. But here's the magic. 20 days of mind-body medicine reverses that. We can change that. We can improve that. We know how to turn the sympathetic nervous system off. We know how to activate the parasympathetic nervous system. And it begins with your senses. And so your brain, if you think about your brain for a moment, I mean, the brain is a great unknown territory. It's magical. It's like a thunderstorm. If you ever flew over a thunderstorm and you see it lightning here and lightning there and lightning there and lightning there, that's what your brain looks like on a brain scan. There's just bursts of activity all over your brain. But as you're going through your day, your brain is, is paying attention to your senses because that's how it gets information. What do you smell? What are you looking at? What are you touching? What are you hearing? And your brain is comparing that to your history. So if you hear a dog squeal and you know you have an abuser in the house, you're going to get up and run and go protect that dog. Your brain is processing all of the sensory information and then using your history to try to help determine if this is a good event or a bad event. If you smell a fire, right? You smell smoke. You go outside. Smell. Okay, is it barbecue smoke or is it a forest fire? If it's barbecue smoke, you know it's barbecue. No reason to worry. If it's a forest fire, you're like, okay, no, that's a reason to worry. 
So your brain is based upon sensation, sensory input with your history. That's how it works. And so if we want to turn the sympathetic nervous system off, we have to give it new sensory input. We make the brain focus again on your senses. And this is called mind body medicine. And so the one that I love to do is called I spy. So let's just do a little bit of I spy really quick. Uh, Rhonda says, to be honest, I've had that worrisome fight or flight from childhood. I was afraid at a young age, laying in my bed, hearing my father's footstep. Exactly. Just like I was afraid of the kid that murdered my neighbor. Right. And it wasn't just me. It was a bunch of people. I mean, we have our high school reunions and we all we we talk about that. It, it 60 years later, 55 years later, it still affects me. Those are very, very strong memories of me being physically hurt. Right. So you're Rhonda having the same thing. And we can't change the past. I under, but the point is, is, is that I, I get it now. It's not my fault. I understand it. And there are consequences to bullying and there are consequences to violence uh, on the victim. And you're a victim and I'm a victim. I get it. Okay. So, but we, what we don't want to do is we don't want to dwell on it, right? It's over. It's done. We have to move on. And, 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 but the challenge is, is we have that memory. And sometimes that memory gets tweaked. So how do we re-educate the brain? How, I mean, how do we restart, restart the brain to move on? Uh, it, again, mind, body, medicine. And that's not the right way to say it, but obviously we need therapy and stuff like that, which we, I'm sure you've probably done and I've done. But when we're finding that we're stuck in those negative thoughts, those catastrophic thoughts, let's Re, let's stimulate the parasympathetic nervous system to pay attention to something else, right? Okay, so let's do I spy. So with I spy, and this is from Harvard, Harvard Medical School, they do this with PTNS patients uh, or PTSD patients like veterans. Um, what we're going to do is we're just going to do new sensory input. So let's just experiment. Let's just see how we do. Because I know, I don't know about you guys, but whenever I do this, I always feel better. Okay, so with I spy, we're going to, I want you to look at something in your room. And so I've got a bunch of purple post-its in front of me on my task board. Revised flare guide, revised diet guide, do an article on solar therapy, do an article on wounded healers. Okay, so just stop for a moment and focus on whatever it is you're looking at. And then let's just take a nice deep breath in, out. Okay. Now, what can you hear besides my voice? Can you hear anything in your house? Somebody playing music? You hear TV on? Your kids playing? Your car driving by? Bus driving by? Just stop for a moment and just focus on what you hear. Okay, in. Out. Okay. Can you taste anything right now? What taste do you have in your mouth? Anything? For me, what do I taste right now? I that smoothie I made that I didn't like. I still taste that a little bit. All right. So just live with the taste for a moment. And go in. Out. Okay. What can you smell right now? What can you smell? Can you smell anything? This is why aromatherapy works, right? Okay. God, lavender. This is uh, a Maria Badescu lavender chamomile spray. Okay. Okay. So just enjoy the smell. And you're forcing your brain to go, okay, what the hell is this? Okay, it's lavender spray. Okay, I kind of like lavender. Okay. Okay, in. Out. Now, I want you to touch something. Touch your pants. Or if you have a blanket near you, touch the blanket. Touch or touch the edge of your desk or your computer. Just rub your hand over it. So I'm rubbing on the kind of sharp edge of my desk. And just rub your hand over that. And now you're telling your brain, all right, what the hell is she touching? 
Well, it kind of feels good. All right. Good. Feels good. Or does it feel bad? No, but this feels good. Okay. Now breathe. Out. Okay. So now we get to the fun part of it. The visualization combined with sensor, with sensation. Okay. Or sensory input. If you could look at anything that would put a smile on your face, what would that be? What would that be? For me, it would be um, an, an animal that I could pet that was friendly. Okay, so think about that for a moment. Just visualize that for a moment. And then breathe in. Breathe out. Okay. If you could smell something that would put a smile on your face, what would that be? That would bring you joy. Easy, hot cinnamon rolls or hot apple pie, right? In, out. If you could taste something that would put a smile on your face, what would it be? What could you taste that would put a smile on your face? Hot cinnamon roll. No, cinnamon crisp from Taco Bell. I won't tell you how many I ate yesterday. It was a lot. Okay. In. Out. All right. What could you touch that would put a smile on your face? What could you touch that would put a smile on your face? a cat in my lap that I could hear purring in out now you can search on YouTube you can search for it's called I spy or you can do tapping tapping is very effective also and all we're trying to do is re-engage the brain in a different way we're trying to turn the sympathetic nervous system off turn the parasympathetic nervous system on. And the research is nothing short of astonishing. The challenge here, like I always get so mellow when I do that, like I'm totally mellow right now, just doing that. It's so interesting. Um, the challenge is, is that when a doctor says, hey, you know, it'd be good if you went and learned a little bit about mindfulness and you're in pain, you're going, I don't care about mindfulness. My bladder is screaming at me. Would you please help me with my bladder? My very first appointment, my my uh, my urologist said, you know, I'd love for you to go to psych psychology, uh, the psychology department and learn about mindfulness. And I, I blew him off. It's like, are you kidding? I can't sleep at night. My bladder is screaming in pain. I hit a speed bump and I scream. And the pain was so bad. And I didn't understand the context. I totally get the context now. Totally get the context. If you are anxious, your brain will intensify that pain and make it worse. But a pain that is accompanied by laughter is minimized by the brain. And isn't that a great thing to have it minimized by the brain? Hendria says, I spy is what my therapist calls mindfulness. It can help calm racing thoughts. Absolutely. It's wonderful. Now I get it. Uh, Sandra, you know, and again, I go back in timing. We go back to the pediatric risk factors. So what triggered this for me? Well, number one, I'm a redhead, so I'm, I'm more nervous anyway. But number two, I absolutely broke my tailbone in the same year that I first had frequency urgency. So that was the ripple effect for me. I'm 100% positive now. I think it's so interesting. Uh, Susan says, where does Dr. Peters practice? He practices at Beaumont Health in Royal Oak, Michigan, and he is a, the chief of their urology department. Um, and he's brought in some of the best IC researchers in the world to work there too. So even if you don't see him, he's got physical therapists on staff. He's got psychologists. They have a whole cutting edge pelvic pain center. I mean, they've got everybody they need there from physical therapists to psychologists to dietitians, everybody. So sometimes patients can fly in and stay for a week. Um, and they have deals with hospital, I mean, local hotels and things like that. If you just feel like you want to do something like that. Sandra says, I have surgery on May 4th. Not sure what the brand name is. I'll have to put it beside, but they're going to put it in your butt with a remote control handset. So it sounds like it's going to be inner stem. 
So, um, although there is another brand name too out there, um, uh, understand Sandra, if you can come on over to our website and read our section on neuromodulation, you're having the more invasive form. There is a less invasive form that most patients do first. It's called urgent PC or post tibial nerve stimulation. It hits the same nerve, but it hits it in the leg rather than at the low back. And therefore, they don't have to do surgery. You're not running the risk of implant infections. Um, in 1993, when I was diagnosed, I was sent to UC San Francisco. That is where both inner stem and postibial nerve stim stimulation were invented. Um, and the guy who invented the postibial nerve stimulation um, uh, did it in response to the pain that people were going through with the inner stem of the sacral neuromodulation. And so the ankle stimulation has far fewer side effects reported to the FDA. Uh, you're not going surgery. It's not super expensive. Um, uh, but, you know, it has to be done correctly. So come on, Sandra, come on over to our website and read the section on neuromodulation. It's under step four because there are other options besides surgery. Most people do the non-surgical neuromodulation first before they do the surgical neuromodulation. Julie says, I had a cystoscopy procedure where my new urologist found an ulcer and treated it with Kenalog. I'm pain-free. Awesome. That's fantastic, Julie. I'm so happy for you. See guys, Hunter's lesions require lesion specific therapy. They're not gonna respond to Elmeron. They're gonna respond to either cauterizing the lesion or injecting the lesion with a steroid known as, as, as she did, triamcinolone or Kenalog, same, same thing, same steroid. Uh, or you can do hyperbaric oxygen therapy or you can do Lyris, but it's not available right now. But, you know, Julie, just imagine they could have put you on Elmeron for 10 years and you would not have had a pain-free response from that. You're lucky you had a lesion-specific therapy and now you're pain-free. And that's what happens with Hunter's patients for many of them. Sherry says, I had a cystoscopy with Hydro plus lidocaine in my pelvic floor a few weeks ago. No improvement. Uh, and no, no improvement in my bladder and no pelvic improvement. Can't tell any difference. I trouble... It's mostly your urethra and vulva that gives you the chronic pain for over 30 years off and on. Uh, 12 years in bed. So Sherry, I mean, is it a pudendal nerve entrapment, do you think? Makes you wonder. Carol, it's either or. It's not the TV show I Spy. It's EYE Spy. You'd already had the hysterectomy with bladder with a bladder pinup in your 20s due to prolapse and endo. Doctor removed the endo from my ureters and intestines in 88. I think I have scar tissue all over your pelvic area, including your bladder, urethra, and ureters. Yeah. Yeah, that's challenging. It's, you know, you too are a very, very complex case. Right? This is... And I think that that's why the subtyping is so good because it really helps you see the diversity in this patient population. Oh, hold on. I get my, got, you guys, I have so much hair and it gets so hot. I got to put it in a ponytail. Denise says, cycling through my program on inner stem. Oh, look, I missed a piece. Um, helps to control my IC flares as long as I control your diet. Interesting. Okay. So again, so Denise, the fact that you are diet sensitive says that, um, your bladder wall is still vulnerable. And, and again, that's worth the question. Um, do you have genital urinary syndrome of menopause? Because if you do, a topical estrogen might help uh, your bladder create more mucus and maybe not be so diet sensitive. Catherine says, I, I felt I was getting a bit better, but started my period and vulvar burning pain is back. Is this common? Yeah, it is common. Some women do flare with different at different stages in their menstrual cycle. And for some women, they get worse when their estrogen high, is high. And for other women, they get worse when their estrogen is low. And this is, this is just kind of one of the mysteries here. 
it's one of the, the mysteries of, of this hormone. I think that this hormone dysfunction is another subtype, but I don't think anybody has uh, studied it extensively and it needs to be studied because there definitely is a group of people, women who are very, from a young age, who are very, very hormone responsive. Now we don't necessarily know why. But again, it's opposites. For some, it's estrogen high. For others, it's estrogen low. And it's just baffling. Carol, thank you, hon. Carol says, this Facebook Live was totally awesome. Thank you. I do try. I do try. That is for sure. I'm not perfect, but I do try. Denise says, my doctor is going to check, my, your doctor is going to check with your heart doctor about the cream. Good. Very, very good. All right, my friends. Let's see. Is there anything that I wanted to say? Um, so we still don't have a firm date on Sister Protec. Uh, Chimera says, what time do you normally start on Sundays? I usually start between 1230 and 1 on Sundays, uh, Pacific time. Uh, but you never know. Um, I'm going to tell you that fire season has already officially, unofficially begun, but they're now saying it's begun. Uh, we've already had 3,000 fires this year so far in the Western United States, I think. Or was it 3,000 acres? Three? Okay. Well, anyway, where I've already had a lot of fires. So it's going to get much more unpredictable in the summer uh, because um, we often don't have power. They turn our power off and, or I might be on a generator and I just might not be able to do that. Oh my God. I look so old. It's so frustrating. What happened? Sharon, thank you. She says, love these lives. Thank you. Rhonda says, maybe it's not the high and the low estrogen. Maybe it's the fluctuation of the estrogen. Absolutely. Listen, the, the fluctuation of the estrogen is, is indeed you know, the most confusing part of it. Um, and one theory is that when your estrogen is high, your bladder wall can defend itself. When it's low, your bladder wall cannot defend itself as well. But there's all sorts of other interesting uh, mechanisms uh, in place that can change our sensation of pain. You know, they say that women sense more pain with based upon um, where our horm hormones are. Uh, also, just so you know, um, we're just finishing up a book called IC 101. It's going to be our new book. Uh, it's going to be our new starter book. It's the um, uh, uh, guide for newly diagnosed patients and grizzled veterans. Um, it is um, a rewrite of the book Patient to Patient Managing IC and Related Conditions by Gay Sandler. Uh, we are doing the third edition. I am now an author on it also, and it is the first book to, dis to discuss um, uh, all the subtyping and to go into subtyping in depth as well as treatments in depth. Uh, it is talking about chronic overlapping pain conditions in the brain, and it is also talking about small fiber polyneuropathy. Um, as well as what makes uh, gay, you know, gay was uh, the first person years ago, back in the 90s, to really discuss all the sensitivity, which we now know is IC subtype 5, because she is an IC patient who is wickedly sensitive, extremely sensitive, the, probably the most sensitive patient I've ever worked with. And, and she's obviously a friend. And, and so the one of the highlights of this book is this huge section on sensitivity and what you can do at work and at home and with foods and with products that might be triggering you a little bit more, even remodeling, buying furniture, things like that. And so I'm really, really, really happy with the book. And of course, Gay's husband, Andrew, has contributed uh, the, the last chapter is his chapter on being a spouse of an IC patient and how to support that. And um, we've been working on this for two freaking years. Um, and it's a beast of a book. It's just a beast. So I was doing the indexing uh, all weekend. Um, 
And now I just got to do the last of the graphics. And then we will have our print version available. You'll be able to get that from the IC network and we'll put it on Amazon. The Kindle version, it will be second, should be easy to do. So I hope I'm going to be done with this um, probably in two weeks, which would be great because I need to do other things. <laughs> I've been working on this for so long and Gay's ready to beat me up because I'm taking so long with it. I'm sure she's being very patient. So. All right, my friends. Well, listen, let's, uh, if you found this helpful, please make sure you like our Facebook page. Make sure you subscribe on our YouTube channel. For those of you on Facebook, please come on over to YouTube and like our stream there. Um, you know, my, uh, the name of the book is going to be called IC 101 or ICBPS 101. And it's just the, it's a class. It's just a master class in what we know about IC and subtyping today. Um, and so I still haven't decided if we're going to do IC 101 or ICBPS 101. Uh, that's one of the final decisions to make. Carol says, what is pudendal nerve entrapment and, and how is it diagnosed? Pudendal nerve entrapment means that the pudendal nerve is being squished. It's being compromised in some way. So an example of pudendal nerve entrapment is when you sit down, it hurts. And when you stand up, it goes away because movement. So the nerve is fine when you're standing, but when you sit down, the nerve is being compressed. Sciatica is an example of a nerve compression. So the pudendal nerve comes off of your sacrum in four sections, then it merges together, goes through the Alcox canal, and then it splits into a bunch of sections where it innervates the urethra, the clitoris, the you know, it just handles most of the nerve function down in your crotch. When it gets uh, entrapped, it can cause frequency, urgency, pressure, pain to a certain degree, but the symptoms are often very positional. You're fine when you stand, but when you sit down or you have pins and needles. So I had what I thought was an outbreak of uh, a yeast infection slash vulvodynia a couple of years ago, but it was weird because it was kind of pinpricking. And it wasn't the way it happened before when I had vulvodynia before. And um, uh, anyway, it turned out to be tight pelvic floor muscles pushing on the nerve. And so the therapy, the correct therapy for pudendal nerve entrapment is going to be number one, to try to figure out where the nerve is being compromised um, and try to release that, aka pelvic floor physical therapy. And then number two, doing therapies that calm nerves down. And so using a topical anesthetic like lidocaine, doing a, a lidocaine infusion subcutaneously, if it's a subcutaneous issue, doing medications like gabapentin or neurontin, or doing palmitoethanolamide, PEA, also known as Piora. Um, oh, my muscle, oh, my legs are tight. I'm, I'm wearing fat pants today. You like my fat pants? <sighs> Life. All right, Piora. Palmitoethanolamide has been studied with a variety of pain conditions. Um, and from sciatica to burning mouth syndrome to fibromyalgia. The research is nothing short of astonishing. We had our first ICPEA study two years ago that showed remarkable success. I've talked about this many, many times. Um, and so um, uh, in that study, they took patients who were not responding to any other bladder therapies. They gave them PEA with resveratrol, which is what this formula is because we can't get that formula here in the US. Um, and by month three, 87% of patients had a significant reduction of pain. By month six, 22 to 25% were completely pain free, and the rest were doing remarkably better. Um, and so, um, when people ask me what I do, because I'm IC subtype five, IC subtype three, my bladder wall looks completely normal. There's nothing wrong with my bladder wall. Um, this is what I take is I take Piora at night and I take our bladder smart multivitamin at night. And um, uh, as soon as I start feeling pinpricks anywhere, that's when I, I whip out the PEA. Susan said, had two MRIs and one CAT scan with no diagnosis, one year pelvic pain. Doctor did find a large band of scar tissue in the MRI. 
Can you suggest a doctor for surgery for pelvic scar tissue? Girl, you need to talk to the other Susan on Facebook. Um, um, uh, I know Dr. Peters found the same thing in this other Susan, and he referred her to a surgeon in Arizona. Apparently, scar tissue in the pelvic floor is, ex is extremely challenging. And in, and in her case, the scar tissue was woven through her muscles. Uh, she had fallen off of a horse badly and that's on that spot. So I don't have a name for you. Um, it's certainly a, it depends upon where it's located and if it's easy to access or difficult to access. You could, if you're in the Midwest, you could reach out to Dr. Peters at Beaumont who made that diagnosis for the other patient and see if they can get, suggest somebody near, near you. Oh, you live in the Bay Area. Hmm. You know, our, our top IC doctor in the Bay Area is Chris Payne down at Vista Urology. Um, but I don't, uh, I don't know if he does that. I will tell you, if you go to vistaurology.com, which is where Chris Payne is, um, oftentimes the doctors answer the phone. It's a very small clinic. Um, and you can just ask, have you, do you, you know, can you recommend somebody who does scar tissue? work with scar tissue in the pelvis. The band goes from your obturator internus and it's attached to the fascia around the rectum. Oh, girl, holy hell. Woo. Sharon says, where can you order? Where can you order what? Oh, the new book you'll be able to get from us. It's just not ready yet. And it's gonna be spiral bound like our Icy Chef cookbook. And you can get Piora from our website I, uh, in our shop. Susan, having scar tissue that, attra that attaches from your obturator to the fascia around your rectum, girl, holy hell, what were your symptoms? I, you sitting must have been really painful. Oh, honey, I'm so sorry. She says I've been suffering so long. Nancy says, does anybody have pitting edema in the legs or swelling all over when they flare? No, that's really rare, hon. I mean, we can have the icy belly when you flare sometimes. And we've, at, we've asked a number of doctors what the icy belly was. And they basically just said inflammation. It tends to come and go. But pitting edema? Mm -mm. Susan says, sitting. Oh, honey. Honey, I'm so sorry. Holy hell. I can't even imagine. Did you ever try one of the one of the Cossacks cushions, you know, that have a big groove down the middle? You know, in our store, we have, um, hold on, where is it? Where is my, where is my cushion? Where is it? Is that it? Nope, that's not it. Okay, well, it's around somewhere. Somebody, I mean, somebody in my house is sitting on it. Imagine a cushion with a groove down the middle. So each butt cheek is supported, but nothing is touching your rectum. That's what you should do. Susan, that, you know, honey, if you call me on Tuesday or Wednesday and talk to me, I'll give you a really big discount on it because you need it. Like I, I, I'm, if I have, even if, if I have one, I, I might just send you one. Uh, cause you need it, hon. I'm so sorry. So my email address is icnetwork at mac.com. icnetwork at mac.com. You can find our phone number, uh, on our website. Just um, when you get when you get that, make sure you do the patient support line or the corporate office, and that will come to me. Susan, you call me or email me, and I'm going to try to get you a cushion because you need that, hon. Oh, I'm so sorry. Holy shit! Uh, it's been a long day, and I'm starting to swear. <laughs> Group 
Gurpreet, Gurpreet says, a recommendation for a doctor in Maryland. Let me look. So I've got this great database. It was given to me by the doctors at Harvard. Um, and um, it's a state-by-state -state database. So let me let me look at Maryland and I can I can help you. Hold on. I swear I just did this. So are you, uh, Gurpreet, are you looking for a urologist or a physiatrist or a physical therapist? Rhonda says, I love the design on your pants. Where do you get them? I got them on sale from Johnny Wasps and they're massively big. I need to, I should have gotten the size smaller. <laughs> they're so big. I've got to take them in like four inches on both sides. I like free people too. I really like the website free people. It's boho clothing. All right. So you want a urogynecologist. All right. So let me look at this list here. So um, uh, the uh, University of Maryland has a pelvic floor program, and it's, a, it's called the Center for Continence and Pelvic Health, and they are in Baltimore, and the name of the doctor is Rena Malik, R-E-N-A-M-A-L-I-K. So that's the director of the University of Maryland's pelvic floor program, which treats men and women with urological pelvic con uh, conditions. The center provides pelvic physical therapy, Botox, and uh, post-tibial nerve stimulation. Chesapeake Urology. Chesapeake Urology has offices in Columbia, Hanover, uh, Owing Springs, Silver Spring. Um, and they have doctors who specialize both in female and male pelvic pain. They have quite a few doctors who work with men with pelvic pain in Maryland. I think your best bet is probably going to be uh, Dr. Rena Malik, uh, Director of University of Maryland's Pelvic Floor Program. Capri says, I'm under the impression that's who all IC patients see. No, 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 no. Most, most IC patients see a urologist, not a urogynecologist, but a urogynecologist has a good advantage because they can rule out reproductive issues like endometriosis and fibroids in addition to evaluating, you know, muscles and uh, your bladder. So, you know, you're getting a, that's, it's nice that you've got two specialties when you see a urogynecologist. Uh, let's see here. Nancy says, I see specialist in Kentucky. Let me look. Only, there's only one listed in this database and that is, um, Ganesh Kartha at First Urology in Louisville, Kentucky. And they are, uh, he worked with Dr. Dan Chosky's on subtyping phenotyping with the U-Point program. That's a different subtyping system. Um, also, uh, uh, Dr. Deborah Erickson at the University of Kentucky. Uh, but she, I've heard she's retiring, but I would look at the University of Kentucky also, Nancy, okay? Dr. Deborah Erickson was the doctor who wrote the article on IC medications and the risk to pregnancy. Gurpreet says, my mother has Hunter's ulcers. Okay, so just remember, if you can, come on over to our website and read this section on Hunter's ulcers and understand that Hunter's ulcers require lesion-specific therapy. It's They're not going to respond to DMSO. They're not going to respond to Elmeron. Like we had earlier, just like 20 minutes ago, it, they're treated with a steroid injection or laser therapy. So we had one patient in our face on the Facebook side of this meeting who had it done uh, with a steroid injection and she's pain free now. So don't waste your time on other therapies. It needs to be a lesion specific therapy. And that's what the American Urology Association said. Diane says, do you have a recommendation for Orange County, Southern California? Honey, Orange County is, is a, a wonderful place for physical therapists. Uh, the Orange County IC support group was one of the best support groups in the country years ago. I don't think they're active anymore. Um, 
let's see. So let me go to California. Unfortunately, finding urologists and doctors in Southern California is a whole nother story. You know what I, I would do in Southern California is I would uh, go to um, go to the website pelvicpainrehab.com. They, they are the Pelvic Health and Rehabilitation Center. Uh, and guys, everybody watching this, if you go to Pelvic Health or pelvicpainrehab.com and sign up for their blog. Their blog, literally, they're probably the best bloggers on the internet for anything related to pelvic pain and IC. In fact, I, I just reprinted three of their articles uh, in, our, in our last magazine. Um, so they have uh, locations down in Southern California now. They've got a location in Encinitas in Los Angeles and Westlake Village. I would, you know what I would do is I would call their office and ask if they can recommend a, uro, a urogynecologist or a urologist, because they're going to be far more up to date on who the better doctors are in Southern California. So for everybody out there, Pelvic Pain Rehab, founded by Elizabeth Rummer and Stephanie Prendergast, are just insanely good. Their, their blogs are exceptionally good. They're doing this fast, fascinating educational campaign on Twitter. Oh my God. I'm just so in awe of what they do. I wish that I could do what they do. Patricia says, why do you think pain is still persistent after 15 years of bladder removal from severe pain? Patricia, because what that means is that your pain probably wasn't coming from your bladder. We talked about that earlier. I was telling the story of one of the first patients I had in my local support group here in Northern California was an elderly woman who had her bladder removed. She was very disappointed that the bladder removal didn't, didn't stop her pain. And that is because now we understand I see more. Today, we now understand that sometimes the pain that you think is coming from your bladder could actually be coming from your muscles or it could be coming from your nerves. Um, and so... Um, uh, I, what I would want you to do, Patricia, is if you can watch my video on the five subtypes of IC, you're basically going to have to go back in time before your bladder removal. And let's see if we can get a clear understanding of what could have been triggering your pain. Did you have endometriosis? Did you have a fibroid tumor? Or did you have IBS and vulvodynia? Did you have the chronic overlapping pain conditions? Do you remember a physical trauma? Do you remember falling? Do you remember, did you have a difficult childbirth? Were you raped? Was there abuse? Were you a gymnast, an ice skater, where you fell on your butt a lot? Um, so kind of if I were in your shoes, I would want to know a little bit more about the subtyping. And I would be thinking back about what could have triggered your pain. What intuitively did you associate with the onset of your bladder symptoms with, did it happen after having a baby? Did it happen after having a car accident? Anything at all like that. And then based upon that, we now, what we want to do is we want to explore these other potential related conditions. Could you have a Tarlov cyst coming off of your spinal cord? Do you have a tailbone that's broken? That's one of the things that we're really seeing a lot of now or, you know, in hindsight, um, all the tailbone injuries. I'm stunned by the number of patients that I work with now when I ask them, did you ever break your tailbone? And I can't believe the number of you who have. And when you think about it, if we use this model, let's look at this model for a moment, right? Okay, so here we have the back side of your pelvis, obviously here's your spinal cord, here's your sacrum, here's your hip bone, and look, here's your tailbone. And if you can see, if we turn it to the side, your tailbone curves under. You know, it's, I, I kind of reverse it. It curves like this. But if you break it, it might heal straight it might curve out or it might curve to the left or right of center. 
And I want you to think about, so here's your tailbone and it's curved inward, but look at all the structures that are attached to your tailbone. You got muscles attached to your tailbone. There's lots of things attached there. And if this is out of position, you're going to have problems. So, you know, um, and I, I told a patient story of a patient who attended one of these meetings. And I always say, you're an anatomical mystery to be solved. And so she went and she learned about the subtype. She went to the doctor and she said, I think I have pudendal neuralgia. I attended this lecture online by Jill Osborne. She went through the symptoms of pudendal neuralgia. And this is what I have. And her doctor said, yeah, you absolutely have this. You have pudendal neuralgia. And as they were studying that, and they had they did x-rays and a CAT scan, what they found was that her tailbone was completely out of position, like massively out of position. And um, so what they, and, and she was completely disabled in pain, guys, completely disabled in pain. She, had, she did not have a life for 10 years. It was so bad. So she embarked upon this long program. It took about a year of working with a variety of doctors, including a chiropractor, to get her tailbone back in position. And it took a year. And when they finally did it, what do you think happened? She improved 90%, 95%, so much so that she had her life back again and she had a baby. So she went from being completely dysfunctional bladder therapy is not working, diagnosed with IC, to being almost symptom-free, so much so that she could have a baby, and it had nothing to do with her bladder. It had everything to do with a bony structure abnormality, her tailbone out of position that was making her muscles completely dysfunctional, making her nerves completely dysfunctional. And so, Patricia, I would wonder, I would wonder, is there any chance that you have a tailbone injury? And I'm going to assume too now that that you had been hopefully under the care of a pain man, a, a pain specialist, um, and that they have been able to try to control your pain a bit. How are you doing with that? I mean, this is where something like Peora palmitoethanolamide would be a very interesting to consider as as something that might help continue to calm some of those nerves down. In addition to what you're the other things that you're doing. But also, you know, even something more aggressive, you know, like um, a spinal implant. Honey, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Susan, I'm so sorry that you're going through what you've gone through. Patricia, I'm so sorry. But carry hope in your heart. Man, we have gone so far. We know so much more about IC than we knew even five years ago, 10 years ago. You know, and... And, and so not only is this world opening up for us and showing us new therapies and a new understanding of why this is happening, but patients, as Dr. Payne said, when he created a subtyping system, he said it was so unfair to tell patients that this was an incurable bladder disease when it actually is curable for many of you, especially if you're IC subtype three and IC subtype four, pelvic floor driven pudendal neuralgia. And as we had this patient earlier, once she had her hunter's lesions treated correctly, no pain anymore. And so um, uh, you need to carry hope in your heart here because we've got some really good therapies that are really helping a lot of people. Uh, so don't give up. Don't stay at home and, sil you know, and suffer in silence and, and laying on your bed with your drapes shut. It's time to kick some butt. It's time to kick some butt. Get up start learning, start reading, and it's time to pick up the phone and start calling doctors and say, I want to try this. I want to try this. I don't understand why this happened. Can you please help me understand why this happened? We never did a CAT scan. Can we please look at my pelvis to try to figure out why I'm still in pain? Patricia said, I tried the implant, was in a wheelchair two years, had your bladder out at 42. You're now at 59 and still in pain. I think Patricia, it'd be really interesting to talk to a physiatrist. A physiatrist is a doctor who studies bones and muscles. And it'd be really interesting. So that's now, you know, kind of standard of care now for patients with a history of pelvic injury. And, and the American Urology Association is really clear. They say if a patient is worse, getting worse rather than better, if a patient is not responding to therapy, it's time to take a step back and revisit the diagnosis. 
And what a physiatrist would give you is an, uh, is an evaluation of your muscles and your bones and your nerves potentially. Uh, but the muscles and the bones, that's the piece that's missing for you, hon. You know, you had your bladder removed at a time when everybody thought this was a bladder disease. And now we know for many of us, it's not. So a physiatrist, getting a, getting a proper evaluation of your pelvic cavity, looking at bones, looking at muscles, having a pelvic floor assessment, you know, seeing, seeing how you're, what's going on with your pelvic floor. It would have been nice to know if your pelvic floor was tight before you had this. And I'm sure it's probably tight now because of the pain. So, and also too, understand that pain that is accompanied by anxiety will be intensified. That's part of the fight or flight response. That's part of how your brain protects you is that if you're in pain and you're crying, your, your brain is going, oh my God, her life may be at stake. And so your brain intensifies that pain to get your attention. But pain that is accompanied by laughter is minimized by the brain. So it's very important that you fill your day with laughter, watch funny things, do happy, fun things. If anxiety is an issue, you got to work on the anxiety because it will help your brain remodulate pain correctly. And so I'm not saying that you're mentally ill. I'm saying that you've been in pain for a long time. You've got anxiety because of that pain. Let's just build some of those anxiety management skills because the more we have that, that anxiety controlled, the more the chance of the pain is going to reduce. It's part of the fight or flight response. So that would be very meaningful for you to try to do every day, just a little. Nobody wants anybody to do something big. This is a this is about building little successes over time. It's kind of like with my dental work. It took months. Yeah, it, you can't just expect something to change overnight. You've had pain for a long time. It's going to take time for you to find that combination that will give you some relief. And so throwing in a little mind-body medicine in there, throwing some laughter in there, throwing some anxiety management in there is the cornerstone of every good pain management program because they know if we don't deal with the anxiety, your pain's going to be is, is going to be intensified. So we got to work on that too. And then also we want to look at kind of some of the new pain management protocols, maybe a ketamine infusion. You know, I mean, although ketamine can irritate the bladder, but ketamine is now being used for pain control in small amounts, maybe the palmito with an alamide. If you go to the National Library of Medicine and you search for PEA, palmito with an alamide, you're going to see tons of studies of this used for pain, chronic pain and acute pain. They're using it for acute pain now too. And there's mega research on this really well tolerated over the counter, not a prescription. Um, and I think one study, I want to get this correct. Now that's medical marijuana. I would be looking at medical marijuana because what they found too with medical marijuana is that it improves the effectiveness of an opiate. So you get, you could just use less, you might be able to use less pain medication if you're using medical marijuana. And, and again, this book, which is free, I mean, honestly for you, honestly for you, the book you need is this pain. This book, this is the book you need, my dear. This is the book you need. This is called Facing Pelvic Pain. It just came out, produced by Harvard. I'm a contributing author in this book. It was a, such an honor to be asked to contribute to this book. This book is something you needed when you were diagnosed because what it does is it covers all of the other conditions that can cause your pain. So there are chapters on orthopedics, there are chapters on the bowel, there are chapters on reproductive systems, there are chapters on the bladder, there, uh, there's tra uh, chapters on uh, rheumatological potential contributions. This goes over any and every other condition that can mimic IC pain and cause pelvic pain. So the chat, let's see here. So um, I think, and, and, and girl, it's free on Kindle Unlimited. No excuses. It's free. Like seriously, Kindle Unlimited. Go to Amazon, sign up for the free Kindle Unlimited. You get a free 30 days. You can get the book for free. You can cancel the Kindle Unlimited if you don't want it. 
So chapter three, what gynecological conditions to lead pelvic pain? Chapter four, what male conditions can lead to pelvic pain? Chapter five, what urogenital problems like your urethra, your bladder, et cetera, overactive bladder, underactive bladder, ureters. Chapter six, what GI problems can lead to pelvic pain? Chapter seven, what musculoskeletal problems can lead to pelvic pain? Chapter eight, what type of bone and ligament problems can lead to pelvic pain? Chapter nine, what neurological problems can lead to pelvic pain? Chapter 10, what rheumatologic, neuroinflammatory, and vascular problems can lead to pelvic pain? And then the rest are on therapies. Girl, you need this book. You need this book. Because it, 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 clearly they missed something if you've been in pain since you had your bladder removed. This book will help you figure it out, I think. At least give it a shot. You can walk in with this and just stun them with your knowledge. I want you to be able to walk into your doctor's office capable and prepared to have a really vigorous discussion about any of these, okay? All right, going to give you your homework for, uh, there was something else I wanted to say. What was it? Sister Protec, we don't have Sister Renew, we don't have. No, no, no. There was something else I was, I was supposed to talk about. Crap. What was it? Well, whatever it is, I'll put it on my Twitter. <laughs> All right. Let me give you your homework. For 15 minutes a day, I need you to do something for your bladder or your pelvic floor, right? Do you get down on the floor and do your exercises, make a good choice on, to sit on your food, make something that will be bladder friendly. For 15 minutes a day, I need you to do something for your spirit and your soul. Give yourself comfort. However you get that, go ahead and sit out in the sun, take a hike, go sit under a redwood tree, go to church, whatever it is that will give your soul a little bit of a, of a healing balm, a few moments of sweetness, do it. For 15 minutes a day, I need you to do something for your noggin. I need you to improve your knowledge. Uh, read. You know, listen, guys, we're talking about next generation now. My, my I'm 60 years old. I started this 28 years ago. I want to do this for another 10 years. But after I'm gone, I need one of you guys to take over. That means you got to read a lot like I do. Okay. All right. Uh, so for 15 minutes a day, read an article, read a blog, go to pelvicpainrehab.com and just read one of their blogs. Come to my website, read one of my blogs, get your knowledge level up. All right, we're not saying we're perfect. We're just giving you ideas and hoping, hoping that we can get you to engage back with your doctors. And for 15 minutes a day, I need you to laugh because laughter modulates pain. I want you to look at TikTok. Don't get stuck into it for two hours like I do every now and then. You know, watch a funny video, watch a funny movie, but we need to get some laughter into your daily life, okay? All right. Life is good. Remember your affirmations. Use affirmations every single day. I can do all things through whatever faith you have who strengthens me. So I can do all things through Christ or whoever you want to use. Every day in every way, my life will get better and better and better. That which is done for you, let it be done. That which you must do for yourself, do it. You've got this. I believe in you. You are strong. You are, you are compassionate. You know, one of the gifts of IC is that you will never, ever, ever walk away from somebody in pain ever because you know what it's like to suffer by yourself. It sucks that we've had to go through this, but you're going to be a better friend, a better mother, and a better sister because of this and father. All right. Okay, my friends. That's a new hug. I'll see you later. Have a good one. All 